I'd never seen Love Island before in my life. I had no idea, well, I could kind of grasp what the concept might be, but I hadn't really looked into it. Some people are watching, they're thinking, oh, I want to go on a reality TV show. Sure. Yeah. yeah, so if you're going to do, a reality TV show is, um, there's so many, obviously, there's loads yeah. of them about. You need to really come to terms with the fact that it is not the answer to your problems. It's not the answer to all of them. If you are a fucking idiot and you have no idea what you're doing now, it's not going to change just from going on a show. People don't want to believe um, what's right in front of them a lot of the time. You know, my two business partners, you know, you hear their stories. They've had like some real problems to, to get through. I never had that, but I feel like I got hardened towards business. And I think in business, you need to just be able to take people's words with pinches of salt. You need to understand that not everything's personal. It's not like a game show that we're on one time. Like we're essentially a cast. It's not like we're even left to our own devices. They tell us what to do and what to say. They should harbor some responsibility for, for the uh, repercussions when shit like this happens. You see Caroline Flack as well. I mean, there's... Yeah, so that's not, not just one suicide since yeah, the show. It's her exactly, as well, right? Exactly. She's the most sort of grounded person you'll probably ever meet. Mm. She's completely the opposite of any other girl that I've ever been with it's just she's just a wonderful human you know i mean she's just like a really good human exactly what i needed definitely not what i thought i needed but yeah it's just like I know, i've never had this much fulfillment out of a, a relationship before wow all right welcome to another episode of the aaron darko show my name is aaron darko and today's host is mr johnny mitchell former reality tv star of love island in 2017 series yeah. and we are sitting here in <laughs> bali we're going to go into so many topics um, we've got a whole list planned. So first of all, I want to know about your background before Love Island. And then we're going to go into what it was like being on Love Island and then your life, your eclectic life after Love Island. So I love it. Yeah. I love it. Welcome. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. Um, appreciate it, mate. Yeah, this is a lovely studio you got. Thanks, mate. appreciate it. But yeah, so all right, how far back do you want me to go? I mean, like, what are we talking here? You want to know just when things start getting interesting, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So where were you before? Like, did you always want to be a reality TV star or what? Okay, yeah. So I get asked that a lot. That yeah. is the one thing because I think right now, I, well, I don't know, especially when I actually went on the show, that was kind of like the big thing. Everyone wanted to be a reality star. Maybe they still do. I don't know. I'm a little bit out of touch with it. Mm. But no, I actually didn't really want to do that. I uh, I come from like a very, very businessy family. Mm -hmm. um, my family, parents very entrepreneurial and uh yeah we've all, always been pushed into that kind of direction i never really got too much out of school uh, my dad actually let me leave school early and i just did like um did like some homeschooling for a bit um but yeah essentially i always knew that i wanted to do kind of something myself um my dad is a very good businessman i didn't necessarily want to follow in his footsteps uh, my brother does and that's completely fine but yeah there's always been like i've always wanted to do something completely different not mm. completely different from anyone else completely different from him mm. um i really don't like england sorry english people <laughs> um i am english but yeah like england it's it's always kind of dragged me down um i've never like the school thing in particular never really got on well there in school i wasn't didn't have like the most terrible time but i just didn't understand the concept because i just wasn't learning that much mm. um and uh yeah so my dad has always been very i grew up with my dad i lived with him my parents split up when i was like nine so i lived with my dad right. after that and uh, yeah, he's always been very um, encouraging behind that. So I had that, you know, there's no trouble there. I was always encouraged to do that kind of thing. So at a very young age, I decided that I wanted to uh, start a business. I didn't really know what it was at the time. Like, I'm a very good artist, but apart from that, I didn't, I was like, I don't really know what other skills I have, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, I always had this kind of obsession with like tax and stuff. Like I've, I've always had that kind of mind where I was trying to understand different aspects of like financial systems, financial markets, that kind of thing. And one thing that always puzzled me was tax. And then I started learning, this is like, this is going to go somewhere. It will go somewhere eventually. <laughs> um, but yeah, I was always kind of like, trying to i didn't get the fact that it was so high in places like england and kind of like having to pay i'm not a tax dodger it's obviously you know, <laughs> anything like that but um yeah i started like looking into places before i even knew what i wanted to do i started looking into places uh that had like very good tax efficient systems where you could uh that they were encouraging for international investors mm. so from at, from 21 i actually moved to hong kong oh. and i started my first business in hong kong so i had a girlfriend at the time and she was a clothing designer for river island and um, she wanted to do her own thing. And I had like, I was doing like a few bits and pieces. I used to collect rents for my dad. I had like 20 grand in my back pocket. So I was like, okay, can I swear on this? 
Okay. Yeah, I go for like, it. Like, yeah, fuck it. <laughs> but yeah, I was about to do it. I was like, oh, I don't want to start it over again. Um, so yeah, I moved out to Hong Kong. And like Hong Kong uh, back then, it was a lot easier to get set up there. Like right now, you can't even get like a high street bank unless you're doing like a million profit. Right. Um, so yeah, I decided that I wanted to go there. I did. I went there. I learned a lot. It took a lot to set up. Um, it was a clothing manufacturing retail business. We set up nice. in Hong Kong. I was sourcing manufacturers in mainland China. Uh, and at 21, it was like extremely difficult. Like the Chinese are extremely good business people and I was not, and I was also a kid. So it was, well, basically a kid. So it was difficult to, um, sort of really get that off the ground it did all right but yeah in the end it were it flopped the relationship crumbled i couldn't afford to live in hong kong because <laughs> it's so expensive mm. so i moved to bangkok and mm. this is where the relationship broke down the business broke down i'd learned so much about it like it, this was i'd never it wasn't i didn't ever see it as if like oh you know this is where I'd, i was at rock bottom i wasn't at rock bottom i was like really enjoying the process but that was where i kind of learned i was like fuck this is not as easy as yeah, people might say, think it is or whatever. Um, so, you know, when you, you, you live out here, there's obviously been a stage at some point where you've told your friends and your family, like, I'm going to go and live somewhere else. Um, especially at that age, for me, it was very, like, it was weird. It was kind of like frowned upon, especially within my friend circles. Um, you know, they didn't, most people didn't even know where Bali was when I first came out to Bali, like 2014, I think I first came here. Like my friends didn't know what Bali was, it was like pre-Instagram. Mm. And um, yeah, it was, uh, I was under a lot of pressure because I told people I was going to go and be like a billionaire or whatever. <laughs> Not that much, but yeah, I told people I was going to go there and I had this yeah. idea and I was going to be crazy successful. And there was a lot of barricades there. I didn't really understand too much about like toxic friendships, but yeah, there's a lot of people that were just like, oh, you're not going to, you're going to mm. fuck it up. So I didn't really want to come home with my tail between my legs. I really wanted to make sure that I did something out there. Um, so my missus went home and I stayed in Bangkok. And this is where like a lot of my growth and a lot of work where I am today is because of my dad, just because of the, the support that he's given me, but also the advice throughout. Um, and yeah, my dad was always... Uh, used to do day trading and he'd always taught me and my brother about day trading since we were really really young kids mm -hmm. and obviously this was like meta trade of four days and like we were just not i didn't even know what i was looking at and i wasn't really interested um but i had uh, subliminally picked up quite a few bits just along the way so i was like you know what that is pretty much the only option that i could see in front of me so i started trading very like very small lot size when i was in bangkok and i started like making half decent money and i was just trading like a very small time window on like the asian markets and uh, then I started like up in the lot size. I started making more money, and then I started learning about news trading, and I started news trading. And before you know it, I was like within a year, I was making like extremely good money uh, off trading. And this is at like 22, 23. And um, this was the stage in my life where I thought I'd like made it. I think everyone does that when, they, when right. they're like a lot younger and yeah. they're like, "Fuck it, I've done it," um, which obviously wasn't the case. But it was more money than I knew what to do with. Mm. I was like, I'd moved from like a very basic place to uh, I was living in like the penthouse in some hotel in Sukhumvit Road in Bangkok, mm. and it's just like I couldn't believe what my life was at the time. And um, I had a lot of cash, had a lot of spare cash floating around. Uh, my dad had just got involved into uh, care homes. He'd, so my dad's always been always been a property landlord. He had started uh, converting them into care homes. So I didn't know what to do with the money. But I didn't want to keep it in cash. So I started buying properties as well. And uh, essentially, we all started adding into this care home business on our own. So sorry if I'm going like well long no, way around. Here. Yeah, it's just, <laughs> um, so yeah, I traded for a bit, and then I ended up investing a lot in property, and that. Was all that was all passive income as well. That was great because there wasn't really a, after the setup there wasn't really a ton that I had to do for that as well. Um, we're still trading on the side, and then I just started traveling a lot. I just started thinking like, all right, I live in Bangkok, and I lived in uh, Marbella for a bit. I lived in Budapest. I lived in Moscow for a bit. Oh. Yeah, I like met some Russian girl when I was living in Budapest, and uh, we like hit it off. And she's like, why don't you move to Moscow? And I was like. Fuck it, yeah, I moved to Moscow. And like that's a funny story in its own about how I ended, ended up. Actually, I might as well go into that because yeah. that leads on to Love Island, to be honest. But yeah, I was, um, I'd lived all these different places. And I, this is when Instagram and like start coming in social media. And I didn't have a big following by any means, but it was, uh, it was, I guess it was more impressive for my age because I was clearly doing quite a lot. And um, then by the time I was 23, 24, living in Moscow, and uh, yeah, this girl was like, she was cool. She used to work for a record label out there. Um, I had started renting this place, which was center of Moscow, like really nice place. 
And um, she used to live in her own place and it was very separate. And then uh, one day I, just, I got like really ill. I got crazy sick. Moscow was an interesting place anyway, but I, I didn't want to stay there a long time. But one day I just got really, really sick. It was like food poisoning. I was like in bed for about two weeks. I had to come around and stick me on like an wow. IV and everything. And in that meantime, this girl had moved into my villa, uh, my villa, I'm in Bali, I call everything <laughs> villa, uh, moved into my apartment out yeah. there and uh, to look after me, which fair play was great. And she'd have some time off work. And then I eventually got better and um, she just didn't leave. She, she, <laughs> she remained in, in the place to the, to the point. And then I found out that she had like also rented her place to her friend as well. So I was like, okay, we haven't actually had like a conversation about this. And um, we ended up having a conversation about it. And like, I can't speak for all Russian women, but I've known a few. And like, they, they do definitely have some fiery tempers on them, which I like only up to a certain point. Um, but yeah, I had like had a very normal conversation. I, I mean, I, again, I can't speak for Russians in Bali and stuff like that, but the culture in Moscow was very sort of like, I feel like the males are definitely the pillars and they, it's not just like, oh, we'll go out for dinner and I'll pay. They're like, if you're with someone, you pay for pretty much everything. Right. And again, that, I'm not trying to be sexist. That was like my observation there. Mm. And this girl yeah. was obviously like, I'm going out to get my nails done with my friend. Or I'm going out to dinner with my friend. Can I have some money? And I was like, <laughs> if you do shit with someone else, you pay for it. Why am I paying for it? Um, so there was like a culture barrier there a little bit as well. But yeah, I basically said to her like, this is my place. This is where I live. And uh, you can't live it. You know, you have to go. And what I thought would be like a very easy conversation was not. And it was like fire and brimstone. And like, I was called a lot of Russian words. I'm not sure <laughs> what they mean. Um, and uh, yeah, we broke up and she moved out. But she, this was like, I didn't know anyone else there. So I was like trying to meet people and shit. And it, this girl essentially was like calling me up. To, like She was somehow spying on me. She knew where I was at certain times, stuff like that. And I thought, I'll make it work. Um, then she, uh, my landlord, just turned up one day and he was like you, you have to leave and I was like why he's like I, you just have to I don't know what she'd even said to this guy but he was like you have to leave and I was like I've got a tenancy agreement he's like you are not Russian you do not have shit <laughs> he's like you're out <laughs> so I was at this point I was like oh god yeah maybe I should just leave and um then I got a message from her one day bearing in mind after like she the industry that she was in she knew a lot of like heavies you know like mm. securities bodyguards even like ex-military types and I'd met them all and they were all cool. But yeah, like obviously they probably weren't massive fans of mine after. I didn't even know what she was telling people. Right. And um, yeah, then I, uh, she messaged me one day and she was like, oh, look, let's kind of put this behind us and meet up and let's just be amicable. And um, I was like, okay. And then I was like reading the message. And I was like, this is so out of tune. And I'm pretty convinced that if I'd have gone to meet her that day, I would have got my head kicked in, <laughs> really. <laughs> so I just went along with it. And I was like, yeah, I'll meet you. I was like, what time do you want to meet me? She's like, meet me at four o'clock here. And I was like, okay. And I Googled the location. I was like, oh, it's not exactly a public place. Some random like back alley restaurant or whatever. And then within like three hours, on the, I was on a plane back to London. Wow. I, told, I told her I was meeting her, but I was not. I went straight, I just got on my shit, went to the airport, got the next flight, went back to London. And then that's when I was living, I'd never, I haven't been back to London for years. Yeah. No, I had been back, but not to live. Right. And it was, it was a weird feeling for me because I had gone from that feeling of really thinking that I'd made it to realizing how kind of like fragile everything was, especially my ego with things as well. I was about living at my dad's. I didn't really know where to go. Um, I'd, I'd like pay, I spent a lot of money in Moscow just kind of setting up a nice little base there and stuff. And yeah, obviously like I left a lot behind. And um, yeah, it, that was when I, actually I got a message for Love Island when I was in Moscow. They had messaged me while I was with this girl and I just, uh, actually the way that they do it is they don't just message you and say, we want you on Love Island. The teams that, that basically do the outreach, they message as many people as possible. They want like thousands of people going up. So you can either interview, but they also reach out to a lot of people as well. And um, they don't tell you what the show is. They say, can we book in a call? And then on the call they say, oh, it's for Love Island. I'd never seen Love Island before in my life. I had no idea. Well, I could kind of grasp what the concept might be, but I hadn't really looked into it. And uh, I said, no, sorry, I'm in Russia, Russia. I'm like dating someone, so it's not gonna work. And then I got back and I was kind of was on like benders a lot. I, was, I just like, didn't have fuck all else to do. And uh, I just thought, yeah, I'm just going to do it. Wait, what's a bender for people? Because some of the bender, audiences are yeah, yeah. <laughs> American. It can be construed in a few different ways. <laughs> so just to uh, clarify, yeah, I was like, I was back in England. So I was going out a lot and I was drinking a lot. Right. And uh, yeah, I was. this is like a limbo stage. I didn't know what I was doing. So I, inevitably I was just like, 
just going to go out all the time. But that, that's crazy though, because you were in a limbo stage, even though you were doing so well in your life. Of course, you just broke. You had a, so it was made basically because of the breakup, right? Yeah. Do you think it was that because yeah, of the breakup, like, how it ended? Yeah, I mean, I could have gone back to Budapest, but it was just like I put a lot of infrastructure into what I was doing there, right. and to see how sort of easily things can sort of get sort of swept out from underneath you. Mm. And yeah, I could have moved somewhere else, but yeah. I don't know. I just didn't have the because it had damaged my ego a lot as well. I didn't really have the motivation to go and do anything. I couldn't be bothered to like arrange moving to a different country again and shit like that. And yeah, it was more comfortable to sort of be like, I'm a kid again, like mm. dad, like tell me it's all going to be all right, right you know, right, right. and just, yeah, it was a weird time. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, I'd, I'd got back to England and I was like, you know what, I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to go in for these interviews at these shows. And like, to be totally honest, these interviews that I went to 90% of the time, I was either still drunk from the night before or I was like heavily hung over to the point where I didn't really know what I was saying anyway. So in essence, in them interviews, I was probably not myself whatsoever. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was like a Johnny that actually wasn't Johnny. Um, and you know, as as these things, you know, law of attraction and blah, blah, blah. If you, I feel like if you really want something that bad, I would never get it. <laughs> you know, if I'm like concentrating, I like, need that, I need it. That's when it sort of distances itself. Right. But then this thing, I just didn't care really. I was going in there for a laugh and I thought, this could be really interesting, but I really don't give a shit, but I don't get it. And lo and behold, they were like, by the way, Johnny, you're going to be on it. I was like one of the last people that they had on. They're like, three weeks, you're on there. I was like, oh my God. Bro, what the fuck is three weeks was from the time you were interviewed. From, from, so you go through a set of interviews. You go through like the initial one, which they were like, yeah, we love you. That's great. You're going to have to go and speak to, I think they you speak to the casting team. There's one other interview in between. I forget what it was. And then you meet the execs who are like the people who rubber stamp it. And if they like you, then you go through to the medical stage and make sure you're not on any like dodgy substances. And you meet a psych so that she's, um, you know, she makes sure that you're not uh, going to do anything really silly on the show mm -hmm. and whatever. And uh, yeah, so I was one of the last people. I probably was the last person. And they were like, yeah, you're going on like three, I think it's two, three weeks you're going on. So I was like, fuck, I better watch this show. <laughs> Let's see what it's all about. <laughs> and I can just remember like looking at the show and the first thing I'm thinking was like, fuck me, everyone is like shredded and stacked. And I was there <laughs> like, oh my Lord. I was like, what, what the fuck am I going to do? And yeah, that was kind of like a weird moment for me because the people that I'd spoken to in during the process were like, yeah, it's like really personality based and we just want these big personalities on. And then the ones that I'd watched, like a lot of them are lovely people and I'm not saying they don't have personalities because I know a lot of them, but they, you could tell they'd been chosen probably for their aesthetics. You know, everyone was like in fucking amazing shape. It's very, it's very different now. I know they're trying to make it a bit more inclusive. Mm. Um, but yeah, back then I was like, fuck, what am I going to do? Yeah. So I had then flown back out to Budapest and I'd called like a personal trainer and I was like, I need to train twice a day, every day for the next two weeks. And I did. And I got into what I would consider the best shape of my life. It was a it was definitely the best shape of my life. Yeah. Still nothing compared to these other people. Yeah. And um, it was just weird. I was like tormenting myself almost. Like I called up the, the casting director, uh, I think his name was Lewis, Welsh dude. And um, like maybe two, three times while I was in Budapest, because I had like shut off from the world. I was like waking up, I was on a very strict diet and I was just going to the gym and then just coming back and just sitting in my apartment. Like, right, what do I do now? <laughs> do some sit-ups. <laughs> and uh, I must have called him like three times. Like, dude, I was like, you might need to like, just make sure you've got a backup. I was like, I can't guarantee I'm going to do this. And they were so like persistent. They were like, no, you're perfect. Like, trust me, don't get in your own head. And um, I didn't realize it at the time, which I do now, but they have they have a strategy of how they want this show to go from the get-go. They know who they want in certain positions on the show. They know who they want to be, like the heroes, the villains. Mm. They know who they think is going to fit well in a certain role. These shows don't work well if everyone loves each other and everyone gets on. It just doesn't work like that. Right. So I was in my mind, I was like, oh, I must, they must just think I'm going to be really good for the show. Because like, otherwise they'd just be like, yeah, right, we understand, Johnny. Um, so in the end, I pushed through and they flew me out to uh, Mallorca. Yeah. And the, like the shit they tell you as well, like the, the amount of time someone was like, trust me, we only have the best looking people from the country on the show. And I was sitting there like, really though? Like, I was like, what am I missing though? Um, so yeah, they flew me out to Mallorca and they stick you in uh, like, it's, it's called like lockdown, ironically. It's uh, where they put you in like a, a random hotel. I was in like a hotel in the north of Mallorca and it was a German hotel. And it was just, like, everyone was like 60, 70 years old. And I was there for like, I think I was there for nearly 10 days, something like that. Because you never actually guaranteed a spot on the show until you walk through the door. So even if you go into lockdown, even directly 
before you're supposed to be going in, they can tell you that you, you're not the right fit. So there is always a chance. So you've geared yourself up for it by this point. I'm already in Spain. And I'm like, yeah, this is going to happen. And then the show actually launches and my chaperone was like, the guy who was like making sure I didn't go out and do anything. You're not allowed any phones, no TV or anything like that. Um, we had gone to like a bar just to do something and not supposed to. And uh, I'd caught a glimpse of like ITV on the screen and I'd seen that it was like already aired like it's already out and i was like oh, oh right i was like fuck maybe and i was like looking at all the dude, other dudes like flashing up on the advert i was like oh my god like fucking everyone's stacked again it was like they lied to me um but yeah i'd seen that it launched and i thought okay so i'm probably not going to go on and then i did end up going on of course like two days later there i was like one of the first like bomb shells whatever you want to call them yeah yeah the arrivals the arrivals <laughs> and yeah it was like there's nothing this it's a very surreal experience and i feel like you're either good for it or you're not like even now like i'll do certain things where like even recording ads that require me to look at a camera and be organic and i cannot do it i can do stuff like this this is yeah, fine yeah. but when i know it's almost like acting and when i i don't know the pressure of it is quite a lot and that big sort of confident ego that I'd had in these interviews, it just deflated like a balloon the day I walked through that door. I could, in fact, no, the, 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 the first night that I went on, I was fine. I was like meeting everyone. I was like, the adrenaline was pumping. First morning that I woke up, I was just sort of like, and I just looked at these cameras. And I was like, fuck, I can't do this. And I tried to give it a couple of hours and I was like, my, I couldn't talk to people. I was like trying to be social, but I was just like, I just couldn't do it. So yeah, I tried to, I tried to walk out of the show on the first day. On the like, first day? Yeah, I was like, guys, I cannot do this. Because the thing is as well, they do this recoupling thing. And it was uh -huh. like two days later. And they had said to me, like, you need to get one of these girls to, like, couple up with you before tomorrow night. Or, yeah, you'll be eliminated. And for me, that wasn't like, right, let's get stuck in. For me, that was like, I need to get the <laughs> fuck out of here. I'm not going to embarrass myself on live TV and get booted out the day after. So I thought I'll do the thing that could save a little bit of face and just walk out. And again, they had it on there and they were like, trust me, Johnny, you're going to be fine. You need to stay on. Everything's going to be fine. They coupled me with this girl. Did you watch it? It doesn't matter if you didn't because it's garbage, no, it's garbage TV. So don't watch it. <laughs> um, and uh, they had coupled, coupled me with this girl when I first got in there and they'd put us on like this date thing. And I couldn't really work out. She's called Camilla and she's a lovely girl. She is. But I couldn't really work out why she was on there because like Love Island to me seemed like oh, you're on there to publicly go through a romantic experience that the whole country is going to watch and have yourself put into pretty compromising positions. And this girl was like, it was almost like she was in line for the throne or something, you know, like well-spoken, like very conservative, like sitting there, like wasn't laughing at any of my jokes and shit. And um, yeah, she was a little bit boring, sorry, but she was. And like, but the nation fucking loved her. <laughs> they didn't like me <laughs> at the time. I thought like, yeah, I just thought she was a little bit dry. That's yeah. all. And um Again, they have this all planned out because I was there like, I'm going to walk. And the guy that I was up against, like, it was me and this other dude, Harvey. And Harvey was, like, built like a fucking, you know, Greek god. And I <laughs> thought, there's no way it's going to be me. But, yeah. like, during the process, it looks like we're all sitting in there with each other all day long and there's no interaction. It's not like that. Throughout the day, you'll have the producers come in and out of that house. They'll pull you to one side. They'll talk to you. And the idea, they tell you that it's to make you uh just to check in with you make sure you're doing all right but it's not it's to plant these little seeds in your head and they'll pull you off to one side as they did with her like this guy harvey he would look he was a great looking guy but he was dry as a bone like they didn't they he didn't fit the bill for what they wanted they had too many people like him probably mm -hmm. already on there and they saw me i don't know but i'm sure i was portrayed as a villain on there that happened mm -hmm after probably about halfway through, which was fine. But uh, yeah, I think they kind of knew, like they looked at my Instagram, I was a little bit leery, I used to travel a lot, I obviously had money. I was like kind of an avatar for pe what people don't like, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think they uh, fit that bill because I genuinely thought I was leaving and then somehow I didn't. And I ended up just, um, yeah, doing like seven, eight weeks on there of pretty, um, I found it quite stressful to be honest with you. A lot of people yeah. enjoyed it. I still speak to, I'm a mate to a couple of the guys that's still on there. Yeah. And they loved it. And I was like, wow, I really hated it on there. Like, you hated the whole experience? Oh, I fucking hated it. Really? I did Big Brother. I did Celebrity Big Brother after that. And I loved it. I thought it was brilliant. But that particular experience, I felt like I was too old for it. Mm. Like, I was already at a stage in my life where I felt like I could hold decent conversations with real businessmen and, like, you know, people that owned companies and CEOs mm. and, like, I thought that would be more appreciated on there, but it wasn't. It was very attention-based. A lot of these guys were very media trained. They had management before they came on. 
if the attention wasn't on him for a second, I'd go and do a fucking backflip or something like that. And yeah, I, I just couldn't gel with these guys. The people that I got on with was uh, Marcel uh, from right. Blazing Squad because yeah. he was a bit older, yeah. lovely guy. Uh, and Sam Gowland, I, I didn't, it's not that I didn't get on with Sam, it was just like, I mean, me and Sam didn't, we weren't really on the same level, but now we're very no, good friends. friends. <laughs> now we're like, probably best friends. Yeah. You know? He's probably the best friend I've got. Yeah. Um, and I think it's because he's evolved so amazingly you know mm. i had a conversation on that show with sam where he was like oh i don't want to go and work back on the oil rigs he's like oh, i really hope i don't leave and i was looking at him like i don't think you are i think there's probably going to be something for you after this and you end up doing jewelry show and now sam is like a very successful businessman mm. and we've got more in common now that's where it comes i got on with him on the show but yeah it was like i think i had a conversation with sam about evolution once i don't know how we got on the topic and i was trying to explain the concept of like humans coming from fish and then over millions of years sprouting legs and like I don't know what if it was for attention or what but it was like what you telling? I can't do a Jordy accent it's like <laughs> you're telling me that fish just one day just decide I'm going to sprout legs and walk out I remember looking I'm like, oh my god what the fuck am I doing here <laughs> Because, like, you know, it was a little bit embarrassing to go on there because I'd spoken to my dad as well. And he was like, John, what the fuck are you doing? He's like, don't do this shit. He's like, you know, you don't need to do this sort of stuff. And I was like, no, I, was like, I think I can get a business angle out of this. I think I can do something. I mean, I, I'd, I'm from Essex. I knew a lot of people that were on TOWIE. I understood better than most that going on these shows does not mean that you are going to be making money for the rest of your life. In fact, it's probably the opposite because it restricts you from certain avenues that you might have been able to take if you weren't in the public eye and uh yeah it's such, such as what um well you know i don't I, I got in trouble for saying this once but like if you just come off a big show like that i said it's not like you can just go back to working in tesco's and i don't mean that to be a dick i mean like if you come off a show where you have that much exposure if you're working in tesco's you're just gonna get fucking hounded you're never gonna <laughs> you are you're, you're never gonna get the chance to like right people thought i was just being like oh too good for tesco like, it's like no yeah. that's not what i'm saying i mean like practicality wise right. it, it's uh it gets in the way and people still do it with me now you know mm. I'm, I'm involved in a couple of different businesses and the love island thing does hold it is over my head people like, oh yeah, I'm saw you nothing. <laughs> and all of a sudden, any sort of like authority that you have is all of a sudden cut down by about 40, 50 percent. So, so it doesn't elevate your status. No, it doesn't. It depends what you want to do. If you right. want to stay in that industry, yeah, uh -huh. it probably does. But right. um, probably less than one percent of people who go on shows like Love Island end up doing anything more than like a year after. Most of them go back to work. Most of the people that I was on the show with now are like doing normal jobs. It's been long enough that they can do that now. But yeah, straight after the show. Most people will come off the the first year that after the show, probably nine months. You make a lot of money. You are like I felt. I didn't expect to, but I felt extremely famous because I couldn't go out without people like recognizing me, wanting pictures. It was fucking weird. I loved it. I'm not gonna lie. I loved it at first. Um, but yeah, after when I say after nine months, it stops. It's like that. It stops dead in its tracks. You stop getting work. People are like excited about the next thing. And uh, if you don't have some kind of strategy and backup plan, all you end up doing is taking that money that you've earned, which is usually about, what, 100, 200 grand, which is good. Most of these guys don't have business experience. They're probably spending it as quick as they're making it. They're not saving for their big tax bill, which they're not used to paying because they've never done a, a, a you know, self-assessment before. And uh, they end up getting into a situation where all the money that they are making is being spent on maintaining the lifestyle that they've accustomed themselves to and their followers have got uh, relate to them and uh, eventually it becomes the sort of thing where they're pumping lots of shit out to their audiences. Uh, they're taking advantage of the, you know, someone's selling teeth whitening if they've got veneers and shit like that. You know, it's the way that it goes. And then eventually the audience lose interest because they know they're being taken advantage of. And all you're left with is a lot of followers and absolutely no way to monetize it. And you, you, you've probably got too much of a big ego to want to go back and, get, and try and get a normal job. Mm. So that's the dangerous cycle that it gets into. Luckily, when I did go on, when I had this conversation with my dad, and he was like, you know, you need to make sure that you can actually make some money out of this. And I was like, okay, what can I do? What's, what am I good at? My skills had improved since I left when I was 21 years old. I was like, so what am I good at? I was like, I'm fucking good at trading. I was like, I'm extremely good at trading. And when I used to post stuff about trading, it's not like it is now where everyone's a fucking trader. <laughs> it's like back then I would post like a chart on MetaTrader and people would lose their minds. Like I was a fucking wizard or something. They'd be messaging me, like DMing me, like how do you know, teach me how to do this. It was a completely different ball game back then. Makes me sound fucking old. But yeah, this was like, so this was, yeah, 2017. And you're so only 31, by the way. I'm only 31. I look old. <laughs> only 31. Nearly 30. Um, but yeah, it was, uh, it was an interesting niche to have because yeah. not many people were doing it. 
and not many people knew how to do it. Uh, and the, the systems that we have now obviously make it very easy to trade. But back then, trying to wrap your head around candlestick charts on MetaTrader and like, you know, load up all your indicators, it's like, <laughs> even I don't remember how to do it now probably. Um, so I thought I am gonna load, load a business ready to go for when I come out, which I did. And it was my first company after Love Island, which was BioCell FX. And that was essentially a trading educational company, which also had like a signal service. Now they're very common now, and I understand they're related to very scammy behavior, but actually my stuff was genuinely following my own signals. And my dad's, we both actually logged on and we would both send out our own signals. And it was via like a text message system. FCA has cracked down on that a lot now, and it cracked down on it at the time. But um, yeah, once I got out of Love Island, I thought I was gonna jump into that straight away, but I was so blown away by just everything when I got out, I just didn't have the time to do it. And I told myself I wouldn't get too sucked into it if it was gonna be as big as some people thought, but I did, it's impossible not to. You really do get sucked in. Uh, I thought I might come out with like 100,000 followers and like a, you know, a couple of weeks of fame, but it was like that series, anyone that's seen it will know, was like, it, it was the biggest thing that had ever sort of hit the TV. Obviously, the series is now big, but that was the one where it just exploded. And I'm not sure why. It probably was to do with the fact that now everyone's media trained. Everyone that goes on there is very careful about what they do and say, I went on there like a fucking idiot and just did whatever <laughs> I thought was the best thing to do. <laughs> and I pissed people off. You Were know? you yourself, though, on the show? I was, probably, yeah. to a certain extent. Yeah. yeah, there was things that I did on there which I thought people would understand because I've got a normal brain. But <laughs> public are not like that. You only have to look at what's been going on like the last couple of years to see how polarising anything can be. Mm. And, uh, you know, the internet is not like an understanding middle ground. It's mm. not. It's either you're fucking this or you're this. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, yeah, there was, like, I mean, I'm on a show called Love Island. I'm there to date people and find true love. Which obviously is <laughs> didn't happen for you though. No, on the show. no. You know, it doesn't happen to anyone. Like, no one goes, if I, I can meet my true love at Tesco's, <laughs> I can meet my Tesco. I don't need to go on TV to do it. Yeah. No one goes on there for that. But that's the concept of the show. Right. And like I said, they paired me with this Camilla girl, yeah. lovely girl. Don't start hating me again, everyone. Um, she was a really nice girl, but she was a hundred percent not for me. Mm. And I was like, you know. I was just making jokes and she was looking at me like I was like the worst person in the world and shit. I was like, I'm not even going to go there. So um, I, there's this new girl that they come in. Now, the, the producers ask you everything. that They want to know everything about you before you go on there. And they ask you what your exact type is and everything like that. And the tactic that they use is to place you with someone who's not really your type at the very beginning because you want to stay on the show. You're going to make it work. I'm not going to be like, I don't like her, I'm going home. No one's going to do that. And that's exactly the same as me. They put me with this girl and it was the way to stay on the show. So it wasn't like I was like, I'm just going to go home, I guess, because we're not really gelling. But I'll get to know her. Then after like the public loved me, I was like the most loved person in the country for like a little while. <laughs> I think I was like the most talked about man on Twitter, at least the UK one, like two, three times in a row. What was that like for you? I don't know because I was in the show. Yeah. But when you got out and you noticed, noticed that. It was weird. It was weird to see yeah. yourself on like pitch and stuff like that. But strangely, not that impressive. Not that impressed from my point of view. Right. It was like, oh yeah, there I am. But then it's not like, it didn't, I didn't feel anything about it. It mm. was like, yeah, the, the emotions that you get when you come off the show are very short lived. It's not like, it becomes normal very quickly. Yeah. Mm. That's what people don't seem to understand. It's like, it's not like you get, it's not like this feeling I had in Thailand where I'm like, I made it. It was like, it's just almost like, okay, this is just kind of normal now. And you, you know, you regret it after a while because it just, when you want it to go away, you don't have no control over it. Mm. Um, but yeah, eventually, once everyone really liked me, they put in this girl who was like pretty much my type, you yeah. know? It was like completely how I, did, how I described it. And it was just a coincidence this girl had told the producers that she was also interested in me before she came on. And, um, it's fucking Love Island, dude. Like, what am I going to do? Like, so I got to know this girl. And bearing in mind, everyone on that show jumped ship or whatever the fuck you want to call it. Yeah. Multiple times because that's the premise of the show. Right. You know, they met someone, got on, but then they met someone who they got on with better and, and, and that happened. It mm. was, it, 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 that was it. So I did the same thing and I actually did it very amicably. They edited the show to fuck to make <laughs> yeah, it look... I saw that clip on uh, YouTube. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you saw it? Yeah. <laughs> so it was like, it looked like it was very in a very short space of time, but it wasn't, you know? And also like, I'm gonna show that lasts eight weeks. I'm not gonna take like two weeks to gear it up and like break up with someone. Not even though it was a real breakup, cause it wasn't. You know, these things happen quite fast paced. Other people did it like that. Yeah. I didn't, I was trying to be kind of like slow and nice about it, yeah. but they, the show weren't having any of that. They made it look like I just fucking went straight <laughs> into the kill. 
And um, again, I thought people would understand, but this girl, this in line for the throne girl, was so well liked that everyone literally was like, <laughs> they would treat me like I was apparently like I was like the worst human being. So I'd gone from like the most loved guy to like the biggest bastard in the world, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> And um, but yeah, in my mind, I was like, people don't understand, you know. It's like I'm on a fucking dating show. Get a grip. That's yeah. what I would be saying if I was at home. <laughs> I'd be like, what's the guy doing wrong? And which I had, obviously, I had more support from the male audience than I do from the female audience. Mm. But yeah, like it was, it was, it was weird coming off that show to like hate because I didn't, I didn't process it fully in my head. And, you know, you speak to people on that show, and they even they weren't really. Like I remember seeing Marcel when he got off. He's like Johnny, they fucked you. <laughs> I was like, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it, it's it's weird. People are like you know, how did you deal with you get off? And it's like again, like I said about dealing with seeing your picture on papers and shit like that it becomes very normal. I actually didn't I didn't mind that much. I didn't like people giving me shit, but at the same time, it was I don't know. I'd always had some level of trolling, you know, because that was the nature of me doing what I was doing beforehand and. Yeah, it was. It wasn't like I, I enjoyed it, but I just didn't give a shit because I thought I've achieved pretty much what I wanted to out of this. And actually, a trick about going on a show like that is that you make a fuckload more money and you get a lot more exposure if you are the villain, because them couples that come off there it gets old very quickly. They're all doing the same shit, and like no one really cares. I could go and do whatever I wanted, and people were just expecting it. It's not like it's not like I could get any further lower in people's estimations at mm. this point. So I was like, I was going out all the time. I was getting fucked up. I was like dating random people i dated some russian girl it was like she was again, like again yeah di like a different like, this girl was like there's a guy called kadakovsky if you're russian you probably know but this bit more than me but apparently he used to be opposition to putin and i don't want to get too political on it but yeah apparently putin banished him from the country or oh, something like that. and he's living in london and this was his granddaughter so it oh, was wow. like there was like a huge <laughs> scandal around that i can remember that at the time and, you uh, sure this, know how to pick them, don't you? Yeah, well, it was like, well, it wasn't tactical, you know. I didn't really want to be in that sort of way. You guys get get the old, like, umbrella poison dart in the leg one day. <laughs> but, yeah, um, I could do whatever I wanted. And, yeah. like, the brands were fucking loving it. Because I didn't want to do brand deals when I first got out. But some of them were just, like, they wanted to, like, chuck me two grand to wear a hat. I'm not going to turn that down. Obviously, the ones that, um, like, the teeth whitening and stuff like that, I didn't want to. I've got veneers the front one the top ones and you know there's nice. a level of integrity that i had yeah. so yeah about six months went by and then i was like right it's like waking up out of a dream i was like oh my god like what the fuck has happened and um i uh, launched this company biosell fx and i got something like eight thousand subscribers overnight it was fucking huge and they're all on monthly subscriptions all paying 30 pound a month wow. i made a fucking fortune wow. and uh the company did really really well for like two three months and then the fc this is when around the sort of time that everyone started doing the same thing. And you had a lot of these kids. Um, so like, I don't know if you know much about like trading and the Forex world, but there's a lot of wholesale signal services who will essentially strap a bot to a, uh, to a, you know, whatever chart you want. And it will essentially read the indicators and it will tell you which way to trade. And um, like an algorithm. And it will, uh, they, they sell these signals wholesale to anyone who wants to buy them. So basically any kid, can buy these wholesale signals and tell people that they're trading, follow my trades. That started coming up very, very quickly. And I know a lot of kids who made a lot of money doing that, like millions. A couple of them went to prison as well. because So the FCA cracked down on this and they said, you've got to stop doing this or uh, you're going to be in big trouble. And some of them were like, okay, we'll stop. Other ones kept doing it. They're the ones who got their assets frozen and end up going to prison. And um, yeah, I obviously did not want to go to prison. So I met a couple of guys who had a regulated trading firm in London, completely regulated. And I went into business with them. So we sort of joined forces and I had like the traffic clearly, and they had a regulation which I could use at my pleasure. So we started getting involved with that. And again, a lot of money to be made. Um, and that, yeah, that was my first little taste as well. I ended up dating some girl off of, uh, she was on Made in Chelsea, but she, this was like a thing that my management like set up as well. Um, she was on the hills. I don't know, are you old enough to know? But there was like some American reality TV I think, show. I think I watched that before. Yeah. And yeah, um, so. some American bird who again was complete fucking lunatic, but 
Uh, it was like amazing exposure. I had this management team who were putting out random press articles out about me. Not that I was asking them to do it, but they were getting a cut of everything that was sort of coming through because they were handling the press. But this dude was putting out articles that I was like buying private islands and shit like that. <laughs> it was like super weird. And um, yeah, we. Uh, am I going too far? Like, yeah. So you dial I was it gonna, back. Sorry, I'm going. I, I was going to wait until you stopped, but um, so yeah, we'll get into the after Love Island. Sorry, I'm more yeah. curious about the on, on on love island like sure. the dark side so for first of all so for the first day you get in there yeah. everything's good the evening of right and then yeah. the morning after that you're like fuck all these fucking cameras fuck yeah. this and you want you wanted to leave but you couldn't leave they wouldn't let you yeah they're not allowed to stop you like i could walk out if i wanted to but they were like johnny trust me this would be the worst decision you've ever made in your life you need to stay mm. they're like trust me you've come this far look at you you've like you've got yourself into shape you've come all the way out you're really gonna throw it away like there's it's not like they're like please stay it's like no your fucking life's gonna be over if you leave kind of thing they really don't want you to fuck up their their right. system um but yeah there's, there was a lot of elements on there on the first day that i didn't like um, they tell you about the producers before the day that you will go in they tell you that you're just in there with the other people it's like Big Brother Big Brother genuinely is like that you're in there with the other people you never see anyone from the production at all they tell you as you're walking into the villa that actually there's production in there a lot and they're going to be talking to you a lot and they're going to be directing you and telling you no not telling you what to do they never tell you what to do but they give you um, they create it so that it's a scenario where you don't really have too much of another choice so I'll give you an example on the first day they were like uh, or second day after I'd woken up, they were like, well, who do you like in there? And I was like, I don't even fucking know. I was like, all these dudes hate me. I've just come in. Like, <laughs> we're the first, me and the, uh, Chris Hughes, we're the first bombshells. These dudes did not like us being in there because it was almost like this was their territory. It hadn't been two days, but yeah, right. they were like, we don't like you guys coming in because they're here to get one of us kicked out. Mm. And um, so they were like, who do you like? And I just, they were like, made me pick something. So I was like, oh, okay, that girl looks nice. And I picked this girl, Amber, who was with Kem, who won the show eventually. And... Um, they were like, you got to go and talk to her. I was like, what the fuck do you mean i got to go talk to her? They're like, yeah, you have to like go and have a chat with her. And I was like, I really don't want to do that because people are going to fucking hate me. And they essentially made me go over and have this conversation. And I just had a really like cringy conversation. I can't, I've, I think my mind has blocked it out from my memory because it was that <laughs> embarrassing to do it. So I genuinely don't remember what I said. But I did it and it was obviously as awkward as it felt because I walked around they're like, Johnny, it didn't work. You got to go back and do it again. <laughs> and I was like, I cannot do this. And they made me go back and do it again. And in the meantime, this chem dude was just looking at me like, this motherfucker won't leave my bird alone. And yeah. that was a very, that's the tip of the iceberg with like a lot of the dark shit that goes on the show. Yeah, it's like it, everything up to them telling you what to do, it's pretty much orchestrated. Mm. You know, I had like a few wobbles on the show they like, um, there was this one section on there where but after six weeks, I was fucking, my mind was just burnt out because they don't give you anything to do in there either. Like they have their, they have their content for the day. They don't want you doing anything else interesting because they can't put it online. They can't put it on air. So they want you to save it. So they don't give you any, uh, anything interesting to talk about. You're just sitting in there speculating about what's going to happen next, pretty much. Like, oh, there's going to be a vote, there's something new coming in. Like, um, and it's pretty stressful. Yeah, you don't even give you a football to kick around. So, um, yeah, after six weeks, it felt like six months. I'm genuinely saying that. I've compared it to prison before, and I shouldn't have because I've never been to prison. Yeah. <laughs> but it felt like prison to me. Like, well, I made like prison in the sun. Because <laughs> you know? yeah, you're not allowed your phone, are you? Not allowed your phone. You're not to, you don't have no idea what's going on in the outside world. Mm. You're obviously like segregated uh, to a certain extent about what you can talk about. Um, so, yeah, it's stressful. You start losing your mind. And um, that's when the, the heavy tactics start coming in. So, obviously, the production know at a certain point what well, they know straight away what's going on outside. They know who's the public like, who they don't. And I was such big news when I sacked that bird off that like they were just like, this is fucking gold. This guy is just, he doesn't give a fuck what he's doing on there. He's just, he's not thinking about anything. He's yeah. just like actually being like organic. I'm actually doing what I feel. Yeah. And uh, yeah, they started like throwing these things into the villa like um, that would just try and like antagonize me. And uh, there's one thing there was like there were like news reports coming from the outside of polls, and they made up some poll, and it was like showed how like people really didn't fucking like me, and it was like people didn't like me, but it was something like uh, it was like an image thing, you know what I mean? Like people thought I was like a fucking 
who I was compared to, like an ugly motherfucker or something like that. And like, that was annoying for me because I was like, these fuckers got me on this show by telling me like, oh, I'm so good. <laughs> and then to see that and like, I was just, I realized that they were orchestrating a lot and it took me way too long to do it. But yeah, by the end, this girl that I was supposed to be with, they were trying to separate us and keep us apart. Like I would be in bed with her and they'd come and get her and they'd move her like somewhere else. And just, oh, fuck. and yeah, in the end, I was just, I did actually just say, look guys, this is not fucking on. I was like, you guys are fucking with me and I'm going to walk out and go in. And they were like, look, just sleep on it. And they knew I was serious. I actually had a breakdown. I was fucking crying and shit as well. And I was like, God, I'm getting the fuck out of it. I'm not doing this anymore. Yeah. Um, because yeah, I thought I must have. It was like nearly the final. I thought I'm not winning it. Obviously, <laughs> like I might as well just get out now and just. Uh, I'm not probably not going to get that much more out of it anyway. And they were like, "Yeah, just stay on for one more night, and you know you might feel better tomorrow." And then the next day, they did this surprise like eviction. I don't know what they call it. And yeah, I was. They gave. They put me in a scenario where they, me and this girl that I was with. They were like, "You have to, one of you has to leave. You have to decide who's going to do it." And I'm not. I wasn't going to be a dick and be like fuck off <laughs> so I was like yeah I was like fair play to them they've given me like a an option where I can get out and still maintain some level of dignity where I can be like I will go because I was dying to get out of there and yeah I did I said I'm going to go and I left and then I sort of get opened up to this crazy shit yeah it's a crazy world wow so they're, they're constantly like mind fucking you basically on the show they mind fuck you bro that's exactly the right word wow it's like they plant seeds they, they push you in certain directions well, let me give you another example. There was like, um, I think we all had to vote within our couples who we, for another couple to be kicked out. Mm. And they make us all discuss it. And then a producer gets, they split us into groups and then the producer comes in and speaks to every single couple separately about what the decision's going to be. So they don't just tell you to do it. And I can remember being there and they were like, so who are you thinking? And I was like, well, oh, we're thinking we're going to get rid of this person. They're like, yeah, I don't think that's a good idea though. <laughs> I'm like, you know oh, why? Shit. You know why? Because they told me that they really like you. They told me that they are like, you know, they support you. They really respect you. Like we think that you should vote for them. So they know what they're doing the whole way through. None of it is, it, like I said, it's, they don't tell you what to do, but it's like everything up to, like they might as well. And if you go against the grain and you tell them to fuck off, you'll be out the next day. Like I did, you know, I was like, I'm not doing this anymore. I was like, I know you guys are fucking with me. And I think I threatened them as well. And I was like, I'm going to fucking get out and blow the lid off this thing and shit. Not blow, it's not like the biggest conspiracy in the world, is it? But, but yeah. Are you allowed to say all this stuff, by the way? I've said it enough times. I couldn't give a shit anymore. All right, cool. Just checking. I'm probably, I mean, I'm under contract probably. I don't even know. But yeah, to be honest with you, like they fucked up a lot as well. You know, they're responsible for a lot of issues. Mm. I'm sure we've we'll, we'll got into the aftercare situation yeah. stuff as well. But yeah, they've got like, metaphorical i wouldn't say i wouldn't say the hands are doused in blood but there's definitely a few yeah there's some that's bits. actually um a, a nice so is there any more dark side stuff that you you would like to share with people because some people are watching they're thinking oh i want to go on a reality tv show. sure yeah yeah so if you're going to do a reality tv show is um there's so many obviously there's loads yeah. about you need to really come to terms with the fact that it is not the answer to your problems it's not the answer to all of them if you are a fucking idiot and you have no idea what you're doing now, that's not going to change just from going on a show. You're going to get sucked into it, and you're going to get chewed up, and you're going to get spit back out again. You might get a career out of it, but you know, even the people that went on there that are still in the public eye a lot, like it's, it's not like they're making shit loads of money. I mean, you know, uh, they're probably doing 100 grand a year, but they're like, fucking, they have to go and be on camera constantly. They have to get put in positions where they, you know, people are knowing all about their lives and like camera crews following them around. And that's like the, the 1%. So, you know, if you're going to do it, make sure it's the right show. Make sure it's something that um, if it doesn't work out for you, you're going to be able to rectify your life relatively quickly. A big show like Love Island sounds great, but if you do fuck it up, there's a big problem. I think there was a dude on there not too long ago who, I uh, forget, a couple of seasons ago and he went on there and, um, they found a load of pictures surfaced of him like prize hunting fucking lions and elephants in Africa, which of course <laughs> is like, but the show, people are like, oh wow, I can't believe that guy. But it's like the, sh the show knew 1 million percent that them pictures were in circulation before that guy went on. They do such thorough background checks on people, especially after like the deaths that happened, Caroline Flagg, Mike. Um, they do such thorough background checks on people. There is no way in hell that they did not know this about this guy. It's impossible for them to have not known this. They definitely put him on there. They knew these pictures were going to come out and they knew it was going to be amazing exposure for the, for the show. 
any publicity is good publicity, you know, and that kind of thing did. But I can't even imagine the hate that guy came out to. And yeah, you know, fuck it, he was shooting like elephants and shit. But at the same time, poor bloke went in there, probably, you know, completely oblivious that that was going to happen. And, you know, he probably, I think he was getting death threats. He probably had a few people try and fucking fight him when he was out. You know, you go to PAs, personal appearances and stuff. It was, it's dangerous for that guy, you know. Mm. That's like that's not just people calling you a fucking asshole. That's like physical danger. Mm. I didn't get that, luckily. But yeah, um, what was my point? <laughs> yeah, talking about the the, the oh, you have to know like yeah. what you want out of it. Yeah, know what you want out of it. Have a game plan before you go in. If you're good yeah. at something and you can structure a business before you go on, um, do it. Have something ready to go because you're not going to have time to build a business when you come out. Mm. While the, you want to strike while the iron's hot, you want to have something very, very ready to go. Um, don't be too concerned about being likable on there because, to be honest with you, I mean, don't go and shoot elephants, but <laughs> <laughs> but don't be like, no, uh, these guys will fit, they come out of a mold these days, you know. Like, I, I don't watch the shows, but you know, I obviously we're in the same circuit, so we meet, meet each other, and like everyone wants to be the most loved person in the world, and it's just fucking boring, and it's not going to get you anywhere. You need to be something a little bit different. You need to show show that you are a little bit of something else in order to do it, um, and you also need to make sure that you aren't going to crumble under the pressure because it's a, an immense amount of pressure, not just on the show but after as well. And um, it's you know the people who it did affect weren't the people who I thought it would affect. But it does, it gets to people, you know, you need to make sure that you you have that game plan and you are prepared to not really have that much privacy for a long time. Um, and also the producers on the shows, they're cunts, they are, they're fucking arseholes, they'll pretend <laughs> they're your best friend and they'll feed you to the wolves. Mm. And uh, they all they care about is getting their ratings and they will burn you to do it, they will mm. absolutely burn you. And it might seem like a little blip in the radar, but some of these things follow you around for a long time. Like I used to get people coming up to me asking for pitch all the time, but even now it's at the stage where people will recognize me, but they don't come up to me. They just sort of like, I can feel their eyes on me. I can feel them talking about me and it's the most horrible thing. Really? Yeah, I hate it. Even now? I hate it. Yeah, even now. Yeah, I mean like, I look about 20 years older. <laughs> no. no, yeah, even even now, because obviously yeah. like that first se series was so sort of, and you got to remember as well, it wasn't just that series. It was like Big Brother after that. And mm. I, I was in a couple right. of like high-ish, Oh, I'm not going to say high profile because it wasn't, but yeah, I was like dating some other people from other shows and like obviously Instagram's still that place with still people following me. So yeah, people come out and like see it, but yeah, it really bothers me. I prefer people to come over to me and actually talk to me because it gives me anxiety when I can feel people's eyes on me, people talking about me. Oh, I'm just, oh, oh, fucking hell. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so yeah, it, you know, you, you got to be prepared for that because it doesn't, you know, it still hasn't gone away from me. It's been five years. Is, was that w when you go back to England especially or is that worldwide? Or? Even at the airport. So yeah, it depends where they air, they air it. But yeah, at Mallorca Airport, I got fucking mobbed. But in a good way. Like I never had, I got loads of shit online, but I never had anyone come up to me and like give me shit in person, which was really mm. weird. Um, it's because they're scared of you. Obviously. <laughs> so I'm fucking I'm the, I'm the devil. <laughs> nah, but... You know, even it was weird. I don't know because yeah, a lot of the time people were like themselves. I was like, I wonder where these pictures are going to end up. We're like probably going to post it when I met this wanker today or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Being realistic. Yeah, maybe maybe that did happen. Yeah, the internet is not it's not a nice place, but fuck it, it's where, it's where yeah. we're living in it. Um, but yeah, it was uh, definitely in England, everywhere, really random places. Holland used to get a lot. Of, it depends where they air the show, but apparently it was huge in Holland. Mm. Um, where else? There's some like South American com countries that um, aired where I used to get like a lot of messages from the stuff. But yeah, of course, most mostly England. Oh, Australia yeah. as well. Right. I had in Australia first as well. So I'd come out to Bali and there'd be people here that recognize me. Like, oh, is Aaron in Australia? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> oh, okay, fair play. How do, so how did the show change your character? Like, do, do, you, do you think it changed you as a person? I think it gave me like a thicker skin mm. because yeah, I mean like, it was really weird because I knew after coming straight off the show, you get your phone back and you're like, oh, okay, people do not like me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, that was the last moment that it sort of crossed my mind that it was an issue. Because like, it wasn't like, I was like, oh fuck, what have I done? It was kind of the show. I was like, oh, people don't like me. I was like, oh, that's interesting. Because I got, I remember getting back and my brother like opened the door to the taxi. He's like, are you all right? I'm like, yeah. I'm like, why? He's like, I just thought you might like, you've had a bit of a fucking rough time in the media and shit like that. And I was like, no, I was like, it's, it's kind of all right. Like, I don't really, I've never thrived that much off of being liked, you know. Mm. I don't typically, it's not that I don't get on with people, but I don't, I'm not like that. I'm not here to 
be best friends with everyone and I never have been and there's always been like I've always had a very sort of certain personality type that I get on with and that actually gets on with me and yeah other than that like I've always had that element of people who weren't really that keen on me and yeah that's probably why I didn't go on that one in school Um, so yeah it wasn't like new for me in fact it was like probably the best thing that could have happened because yeah it taught me that real resilience it taught me like fucking hell like it uh, taught me a lot about other people that's actually the the best thing because you realize that you're you know people say at the time if you're doing well people don't like you but i would get to the stage where i was like if i wasn't getting that much hate i would genuinely think like fuck i'm really i'm not doing enough Mm. like there's not enough going on Mm. like i need to be doing something like my i was getting like ten thousand comments on a photo <laughs> like, <laughs> like fuck you um but yeah i started relating it to like success because yeah. i'm like okay the more that i'm doing like people just fucking can't stand it there was like these, the papers were eating up as well I mean, you know they were talking about like they were calling me a fake millionaire remember that being the thing now i had wow. never gone on that show and yeah before when i went on the show i was a millionaire yeah. not like uh, I didn't have a million quid in the bank, but yeah, I was a fucking asset millionaire. Yeah, worth it, yeah. Who the fuck wants a million quid in the bank now anyway? Yeah, yeah exactly. So yeah, um, I was, but then um, I'd never told anyone that I was though. They had seen my Instagram, they're like, this guy's fucking Keiko. And uh, I was obviously traveling around the world and staying in all these beautiful places. I'd never told anyone that I owned these places. I was like 25 years old random and then there was this newspaper report going like Johnny rents these places on Airbnb bear in mind these are all like stunning places in like the best location like Johnny's rents these apartments does not own them I was like I never fucking said I did. Like yeah. I don't even understand that. Like as if that's not. Imp- I was like, you do it then. Then <laughs> can do it. Why don't you fucking go do it? It was so w- random. They were just like, it was a, it was a big witch hunt. But yeah, you you do get used to it, and you realise like you need that because the other people, uh, bar a couple of people, they faded into the background so quickly. Because there's only so much you want to watch, like a relationship and people doing that kind of shit. People want to see something that's a bit more unpredictable. Especially as soon as I started doing the forex stuff, people were like losing their minds over that. Because people were like, this is something different. This guy has actually got his head screwed on to a certain degree as well. Um, I remember, I think, Pierce Morgan had me on his oh, show. I saw that clip, yeah. Yeah, and like, oh, mate, I was running. It was really funny because I was running about two hours of sleep and I went in there without any shoes because I had such big blisters <laughs> on my feet. And I don't know what the fuck they must have been thinking. But yeah, he were, he like tried to. I know yeah, I fucked up. I'm not great at math. I'm a trader. I should be better at math. But yeah, he's like asking me some random like. Math he asked stuff. you, um, what's ten? What's eleven times fifteen? And you're like, oh, 160. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but then like he was like the. the he asked me some, a politi- I think he asked me who the German Chancellor was. And I was like, Angela Merkel. And he was like, all oh, right, yeah. yeah. And then all of a sudden it was like back to maths questions and shit like that. But that was the kind of thing that they were doing. You know, right. they wanted like, something, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, what's the Chancellor? Um, but yeah, like that was an interesting one. But yeah, I think the idea is that people kind of realized that I wasn't just there to sell random shit to them. Mm. I was there and I had like a little bit of substance to me. Mm. And you know, I, I, the the money that I had and the things that I did, it didn't just come from that. There's people like accusing me of like Photoshopping myself like into planes and stuff and shit like that. I was just like, it was the weirdest, it really was the weirdest time of my life. But yeah, people don't want to believe um, what's right in front of them a lot of the time. You know, like it's easier for people to, you you know, this is well, like everyone fucking knows this surely by now, but yeah, it's easier to try and take something away from someone who's achieved something and mm. pass it off as, oh, you know, oh, you fucking lucky or you know uh, daddy give you that money and shit like that rather than just be like yeah that person's actually doing all right they're doing well for do you time. think that's like an english thing though because I, I experience that a lot like in england like english people are like that a lot and, and yeah. australians too yeah maybe it is built into our but country. in america it's not yeah. it's not the same in america no because yeah. america's like yeah fuck yeah american dream yeah. bro <laughs> <laughs> and that's what we need we need that shit, don't we? because um i have feelings that us, you know, they they sync with that thing as well. Like, you know, I've had them feelings before. I see someone, then well, I think, oh, bastard. But then I don't like go and fucking like. I use it as something to make myself yeah, better. You exactly, know, exactly. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. I don't, I don't ever look at someone and think I am going to comment on this stranger's photo and tell him that he's a, that he's a, <laughs> he's a fraud. <laughs> he's a scam artist. You know, he's lying about all the money that he's got. Um, because the thing is, there's no lie. I never told anyone. I think the yeah. papers asked me as well. They're like, well, how much money do you have? I was like, none of your fucking business. Mm. How much money I've got? Yeah. What is this? Yeah, yeah. 
Um, so yeah, uh, maybe it is an English thing. We were a weird culture in England. After yeah. living abroad, I've been living abroad for 10 years. Yeah. You realize, you go back to England, you realize it's a very aggressive culture. Mm. You, you pick up on that. You know, you go to places like Bali, you see the kids and they're all fucking love of each other. Like, oh no, I love you. Mm. I guess it's because they got that karma sort of thing built in from a very young age. You sort of see all this shit when you're in England and like all you have to do is not put your indicator on in London and all of a sudden you've got someone trying to break your windows and shit. <laughs> it's so aggressive. I hate going back there. I actually hate going back to London. I think, I think it's just the like they're all just unhappy like, yeah I think just, it is. the more yeah. miserable you are of your own life the more you just project that outwards right it's probably a massive part yeah. of it it's like you, see, you, ever, you, ever, you ever like seen it here where someone cuts you up and then you sort of look out the window and they're like hello <laughs> <laughs> it's like oh that's diffuse the situation I, I, I have seen a few angry indonesian people have you? Like, yeah <laughs> I've, I've seen a couple of angry ones but, but yeah the traffic, for the most part it's yeah like, for sure they're for nice sure. they're like oh sorry sorry yeah yeah exactly <laughs> It's funny because like that that bubbles up to me. You, have you ever had like a go? I mean, I've, I had trouble getting it. So I imagine the Gojeks have trouble getting it, right? Sometimes, yeah. <laughs> and like sometimes I'll I have I take I've gone out to the street and I've taken pictures of like how to get to my house and I've drawn arrows on it and I use it every time that I've Gojek and sometimes they still fuck it up. And I'm there and I can feel myself getting like really like annoyed with him I'm like this fucking idiot like what's the matter and then he shows up and he's got this massive smile on his face and he's like oh sorry sir and then instantly I'm like oh I'm a cunt I'm a fucking horrible bastard like this guy is just trying to trying to do his job he's just trying to get on with his life like I don't know how hard it is to be one of these guys but yeah it's that uh, it's just bubbles up inside us sometimes don't yeah, it? I'm not, sure. you know it teaches me that we should be more tolerant you know, it's crazy yeah um, yeah so so that's Love Island, right? We mm. spoke about that. And then, so how you dealt with the fame, mm. I think it's because of what, from what I'm hearing is the strength of your character, you were able to deal with the fame better than some other people. Maybe, on the show. because I feel like I had already geared up to it. I'd already mm. been in business for like six right. years. Yeah. Uh, I had dealt with some very unpleasant characters. I haven't had like, you know, I've heard some really inspirational. I, I've never had what I would consider like real trials in my life. Maybe that's to come. Who knows? My two business partners, you know, you hear their stories. They've had like some real problems to, to get through. I never had that, but I feel like I got hardened towards business. And I think in business, you need to just be able to take people's words with pinches of salt. You need to understand that not everything's personal. Um, and also kind of like see people for what they are a little bit more. And like, mm. I don't want to sound like a dick, but the people that were like giving me shit, these are not like the kind of people that I give a fuck about, you know? Mm. These are not see, well, there's a few people that gave me some shit. Where I was like, oh, fuck, you know, what are you doing? Like people who I actually would have looked up to otherwise. Mm. Um, but yeah, mo for the most part, these are people that I just, I just thought if you're getting sucked into a TV show so much that you've forgotten about your own life, you know, why do I give a shit what you said? <laughs> the way that right. I used to describe it is that, like, when I wake up in the morning, like, it is 100% the Johnny show. I am thinking about, like, what I'm going to do for today. I'm thinking about how I'm going to make my life better and the ones that I love better. I'm, everything is, you know, how am I going to progress? That's it. I don't, I'm, I'm ultra good at minding my own business. That's always been something that my dad said, just, just trust me, mind your own business. And, like, you, problems don't come into your life. Always mind your own business. Mm. And, and that's exactly what I've done. I don't get involved in other people's shit. I never have. It's never been something that that's my thing. But then you look at these people where it's like they are more invested in the Johnny show than they are in their own show, you mm. know? They're extras in my sure. TV show. They're Well, they're extras in their own TV show. That's yeah. what's fucked up. They're not sitting there thinking like, wow, this is, you know, I could really give this guy some shit right now because it's annoyed me. It's triggered me watching him on TV. But instead of doing that, I'm going to go and fucking do something with my life. I'm going to go and have a great day. Mm -hmm. They're like, no, I'm going to try and bring someone on the internet down. And it's like, that's exactly what it is. You, there, there's no value to their own lifestyle enough for them to, well, yeah, the lifestyle is, is obviously isn't worth enough to them to actually concentrate on it. They want to bring themselves into my world mm -hmm. and they want to try and make my day worse. But yeah, mm -hmm. a couple of times at work, you know, but I used, a lot of the time I would get fucking shit faced on a night out. The next day I'd be super hungover and I would just basically like have verbal fights with everyone on my Instagram comments because <laughs> it was fucking hilarious. It was yeah. hilarious at the time. It'd just be like this, the people, the things people were saying, and um, and it was also like driving up my comments. Like I was charging like fucking god knows how much for a post back then. But yeah, it was like ten thousand comments. Like everyone is looking at this thing. My engagement was insane. Um, so yeah, it all kind of like. It all played in. But yeah, I mean, maybe it was a character thing. Um, I don't know if it's something that developed over time or, if, or I don't know if I'm just like, I've always been told that I can emotionally 
switch on and off quite mm. well. Yeah. You know, I uh, don't think that's a good thing. It's probably not a good thing. Simone, who my <laughs> girlfriend, who, yeah. you know, she's yeah. very good at leveling me out with that. But yeah, she mm. said that like, she's like, is that bothering you or not? Because I can't tell. I'm mm. like, I don't really know if it's bothering me. Like I have like, it will cross my mind for a moment, but then other things just take priority. Right. Yeah, when yeah. there is something really that bothers me. Mm. It's like that business mind. It's like maybe, the logic, maybe, logical yeah. mind. Yeah, tunnel, tunnel vision. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. like the other stuff is almost like collateral damage. It's like, okay, I don't like that, but go away. I've got this to worry about. Right, yeah. yeah. So we'll touch on um, your relationship side. and all Yeah, that. yeah, yeah. So I want to go back to the show because um, on the show, you, you create a strong friendship on the show with yeah. a guy called Mike. Yes. I can't pronounce his last name. Talis- Talisitis. 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 Yes. Oh, yeah, I can't do it, yeah. So um, yeah, talk, talk about that like experience, like meeting me, connecting sure. with him. And- so Mike came on the show relatively late on and like Mike was a fucking very good looking chap. He's definitely the best looking chap. He was about six foot five, something like that. He was like a Greek tan going on. He's like chiseled features. Dude was like a good looking bloke. And he was also like, he was from East London as well. And he was, so I actually grew up in East London. So we were from similar parts. And, but Mike was like a fucking complete, he's like a road man. You know? <laughs> <laughs> he was like, he talked a little bit sort of East London. He was like, he didn't take shit from anyone. He's like, what are you, talk- what are you looking at? What are you looking at? If someone would like, it was just fun. I mean, I've been out with Mike a few times and he's fucking argumentative. Someone gives him the wrong fucking look and he was just like, you know, completely jump off the handle. So he came in and the other guys instantly didn't like him because he's a fucking good looking guy. Yeah. And he, you could tell he wasn't going to bow down and be anyone's sort of like little bitch. It was like a prison. He went in there and just sort of like went, was, just doing whatever he wanted. And I thought he was fucking brilliant. As soon as he walked in, because I could tell he was winding everyone else up. I knew that the other people were threatened by him. And that was like, for me, I was like, oh, it's interesting to watch that because they, no one else had had that. And they instantly tried to like make a problem with him. And there was like a huge fight on like the first day Mike came in. He didn't actually punch anyone, but he trashed the place and like kicked over this fire pit. And uh, yeah, from then on, me and Mike were just friends. Because I thought, you know what? He's not in here trying to be like a bitch to all these guys. He's really standing up for himself. And um, yeah, I respected it. So him, uh, me, Marcel, Jamie Jewett as well, we were all just like very, very tight from that moment on. And Mike, when I first when I first came off the show, was definitely the one that I stayed in touch with the most. Me and Mike would see each other two, three times a week. We were wow. always doing something, whether it was dinner, we'd be going out. He would always be like on the phone to me trying to get me out to, um, you know, usually a fucking nightclub, unfortunately. And um, yeah, it was... Uh, it was went on like that for a while. Mike was making very, very good money because he had that personality. Do you, have you ever seen any clips of him? It's the best way to sort of describe him. It's like there's another dude called Jack Fowler who's like a similar sort of character, but it's very sort of like no nonsense sort of stuff. He's a proper geezer, you know, but yeah. good looking bloke as well. So yeah, they were eating him up and he was making an absolute fortune and he was, um, you know, spending a lot of his energy on doing PAs and out. I don't know you know, really what he was getting into at the time, but it was probably the same shit we were all getting into, to be honest with you. I don't know, you know, unhealthy habits to a certain extent. Um, And yeah, we, he started dating a girl called Megan McKenna, who was on TOWIE, and they had, I didn't mean him lost touch with each other, probably for a couple of months there, something like that, two, three months. Um, There's a lot of shit that went on there, which I probably can't talk about, I'm probably not allowed to. Um, yeah, because, yeah. And uh, they essentially broke up. And I remember that being, like, a turning point for Mike. I remember him, like, calling me up and he was like, yeah, let's, like, go out for dinner, come meet me for dinner. And I was there and he explained to me what what was, like, going on. And it was, like, very heavy shit. And um, he seemed like any bloke that had just broken up with his bird, if you know what I mean. Like, mm. I've had mates who have broken up with their birds. It's always very difficult to see how things affect people. And from an outsider's perspective, Mike had it all going for him, you know? It was like, I never looked at him and thought, wow, he's, we need to keep an eye on him because he's in a fragile place. He was Mm -hmm. like, you know, I'm upset, but fuck it, life goes on. We went out, I think me and him hit like a fucking strip club that night just to like (laughs) cheer him up. And uh, we were there with his manager and like, uh, yeah, within two weeks later, Mike had hung himself. He actually hung himself behind his house. And um, yeah, it was like a really weird thing because when he, I told you he was like, in, he was in like some bad crowds. He was like proper with it in with them people. And like Sam Gowland actually called me up and he was like, oh, have you seen it? And I was like, what? He's like, Mike's, uh, Mike's dead. I was like, what the fuck are you talking about? And uh, yeah, he was like, I instantly thought, he told me he'd killed himself. And I was like, 
Mike didn't kill himself. It's like definitely not. I was like, this must have been, he's got in like some kind of a, a thing with some other people because um, it was always like that around where he used to live. And yeah, I genuinely thought maybe something there had happened. There'd been an altercation. But yeah, I mean, I mean, I don't, I don't know the ins and outs of it. I was at the funeral. I never spoke to his family. I got on with his family, but I didn't really, uh, well, what, what am I going to do? Start poking my nose around. And like, what happened? That's well, the last thing that anyone wants. So yeah, it was, there was a lot of strains there on Mike. And that's why you need to be prepared for this sort of show because anyone coming off that show probably would have thought, if they had to pick someone that was going to be in that position, it probably would have been me because I was the one by far that got the most hate coming off. I was the one that was definitely tested in terms of like the public. Mike had his fair share as well because again, people don't like seeing a good looking guy. Everyone wants to sort of bring you down a little bit. Um, but yeah, I, from an outsider's perspective, I thought Mike really had it together. He just opened the restaurant or it was just opening in Chingford. And uh, yeah, it kind of seemed like he had, you know, he'd had a breakup. But he was on his way. There's external factors there, and I don't want to talk about him because I yeah, don't know a hundred percent. And out of respect to his family and him as well, yeah, it wouldn't be right to do it. Um, but yeah, whatever Mike was going through was probably, without a doubt, a, a pro- well, yeah, probably without a doubt, it's a bit contradictory. But I would say at least ninety percent a byproduct of what he went through after the show. You know, like what what the lifestyle that he was thrown into. He was making a lot of money. I don't know if he was having money issues I don't know uh, there's a lot of drugs in that circuit I don't know if he was doing drugs but again that fucks with you a lot um, lots of sleepless nights he'd just been through that and yeah he had um, he had I'd seen him literally yeah, uh, maybe a week maybe two weeks before something like that but it was very soon but yeah he's a good friend of his who I met a couple of times he was getting phone calls from Mike at like early hours in the morning and this must be fucking really hard because he was getting phone calls from Mike the night that he died, like early hours of the morning, Mike kept on calling and the dude was asleep so he just didn't answer the phone. But he think, you know, Mike might have been just trying to, anyone to give him a reason to like not do something. I think the police checked his phone and showed that it was online for like a couple of hours uh, before he actually did it. But yeah, it's fucking, it's, it's, it's a weird one because I don't know if I was, I've never, contem- I've never been suicidal and if, but if I was, I don't know if that is the way that I'd do it. It feels like a very, you have to really, that takes a lot of pre- preparation, right? You, he's, I don't, I don't know the ins and outs, but I, as I understand it, he hung himself from a tree. Like he's got up into a tree, he's set up a rope, he sat there for a while and then he's just jumped off the tree with a noose around his neck, which is fucking crazy. And I don't know if it snapped his neck, I don't know if he choked, but it's a fucking very, I imagine, gruesome way to die. So for that to happen and whatever he was going through, yeah, I, it's bizarre to me that no one really picked up on it. Yeah, and it was, and I genuinely didn't. You know, I thought it was, I've broken up with birds before and it's been really tough and I kind of just naturally assumed it was the same thing. So yeah, I don't really know. Yeah. Um, How did that affect you though? At, at the time when you found out about that? Yeah, it fucked with me. Like yeah. the in, instant, instant thing that I, I mean, I don't know if it can be considered denial, but I was convinced that it wasn't like a suicide because I thought I saw him very recently. Mm. Um, but yeah, it did damage me. I, it, it made me harbour like a, a very strong resentment towards the show. Mm. Um, and it's not anyone's fault. I can't blame the show. can't put my finger out. I wanted to back then. But I can remember the show instantly as soon as it hit the papers, the same day the show were on the, the aftercare team from the show were on the phone to us oh, we just wanted to like talk to you and make sure you're right. And I can remember having a conversation. I was like, are you fucking kidding me? I was like, you guys see my Instagram. You know the shit that's been put on my plate for the last six, seven, or like, no, probably a year. I was like, you guys know what I've been through. I was like, I've never had a fucking phone call with you once. And now you're trying to cover your backs. And you want to call me up. And I was like, mm. fuck off. Mm. Got a bunch of fucking vultures. Mm. Um, and yeah, that's where I harbored the dislike from because it's their job. They benefit from the show. We benefit as well. There's no doubt about it. But the argument that I've heard from a lot of people is, you know what you're getting yourself into, you go on that. But the truth is, you don't really know what you're getting into. You don't want to sign up for that level of mental anguish. No one signs up for hate. No one goes on a show like that thinking, oh, I can't wait to be the most hated person. Like people, people. Right. I didn't go on there and do anything, you know, inherently wrong. I didn't go on there and fucking do half the shit that most people are doing on there. But the show decided that they wanted to portray me and edit me in a certain way that just fit the character that they needed. Mm. And that's fine to a certain point, but they need to then take their level of responsibility. It's, you know, we're not like, it's not like a game show that we're on one time. Like we're essentially a cast 
it's not like we're even left to our own devices. They tell us what to do and what to say. They should harbour some responsibility for, for the uh, repercussions when shit like this happens. You see Caroline Flack as well. I mean, there's... Yeah, so that's not, not just one suicide since yeah, the show. It's her exactly, as well, right? Exactly. And I'm, you know, um, so her boyfriend at the time, Lewis Burton, is actually my old business partner for the training. Right. So I was like somewhat tied into that as well. And, and again, it's like it shows... That was not necessarily to do with the show, but it was more to do with the public. You know, they're just people love a fucking witch hunt, don't they? It's just mm. like it's it's basically the same as it was in like the fifteenth fucking century, right? Fucking bad, bad mistake. <laughs> but it's just got like right. a modern twist on it. You know, it's the mob. One minute everyone loves you, and all you have to do is do one thing, and people get this this rush out of disliking someone and. You know, oh that bastard! And it's it's really weird trait, and, and, and genuinely, it's not just because I've been in this situation. I've never been like that. I, um, you know, even before, like I used to have like an ex girlfriend that would like comment on people's photos, or, like uh, that were on these TV shows, like giving them shit. And I'd just be like, "What the fuck are you doing? Like, mm. you're not embarrassed that you do that." Mm. <laughs> you know, Dapper Lasses. No. Dapper Lars, he's a comedian. I was on the Celebrity Big Brother with him. All oh, right. And uh, I remember coming off the show with, with him, and he's quite famous in the UK. And uh, I then got with my ex, and we all went out to dinner one time. And uh, he was like scrolling down his photos, and he saw just real coincidence. He saw that she had trolled him on a post from when he was in Big Brother, and she didn't even remember doing it. She, she did it when she was shit faced. But I remember just being like, "Oh my fucking <laughs> god!" She like, and it was like a bad one as well. She's like, "You fat cunt," or something like that. <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> so bad. And he was like, "Is that you?" And she was like, "Oh my god!" And I just like, I just sunk in so I was like, "No, you did not do that." Um, so yeah, it's it's that kind of thing. I never, I, I genuinely don't understand it. But, Neither um, do I, man. I, I just really no. don't understand it. This shit that I don't like, I keep it to myself. Yeah, exactly. like, I don't need to let. I don't need to bring someone else into it. Like yeah. this is my world. You got your world, and but yeah, I think Caroline Flack. The, the show obviously cut her loose, didn't they? There was like some drama, and I think they got rid of her, and they'd like there was probably not much aftercare for her. That, I'd say that's. I don't know that for a fact, but yeah, certainly to do with the show. I'm. Uh, I'm not sure how they do it now. But again, there's that case with the dude with the like the prize fight uh, prize hunting in africa mm. there's there's no way they didn't know about that they put people in these situations to make good tv but there's no accountability for the repercussions mm. and it's fucking bad and i that's when i sort of thought you know i don't really care about whatever contract i do have i'm not even sure and i went on the news and i was fucking spilled all the beans about all the show and i never got any legal letters from America. it would have probably looked pretty bad on their part anyway if they just started trying to legally pursue me after they yeah, exactly. may have some accountability there um, and you started a petition as well right yeah what was, I, I don't maybe you mentioned this earlier but like my what was that petition about it was it was to, to do with the aftercare of the show oh yeah because yeah, were... there was like a few there was a few ideas that we were like spitballing about and one of them was to like take down Love Island completely and I thought no nah, it just sounds too I mean, there was obviously people that did want it to be taken down completely because it's two deaths. It's not like, well, there's obviously some connection there. But yeah, I wanted the accountability there. I wanted to make sure that they just actually, yeah, took took their responsibility and actually weren't just, okay, thank you, you're done now, thank you very much. Because they don't pay you for the show either. You sort of take your chances with it. Mm. Um, and they make shitloads of money. And, and th the worst part is, is that, like I said, you don't know what you're getting into. They missell that opportunity so bad. It's so missold. And they tell you, like, they butter you up when you go on there. They're like, this is going to change your life. Like, imagine you're never going to be able to, like, go out again without people wanting to take selfies with you. Think about all the money you're going to make. They say that shit. It's not in writing, but there's a lot of that because they want to keep you hyped before you go on there. So there's no, like, excuse me, look, this could go really well for you, but there's also a chance that everyone's going to fucking hate you. And there's also a chance that you might not be able to handle the pressure after. And there's also a chance that you might go broke and not be able to get your old job back. And, you know, there's a chance that you might have suicidal thoughts and we're not even going to pick up the phone to make sure you're right. That should be a, as much of it as the other stuff. Yeah. It should be balanced. And right. that was the what the petition was about. It was about making sure there was actually fair practices in place to inform people what they're actually getting themselves into because people mm. don't know. I get people messaging me now like saying, oh, you only you only have so much money because you're on Love Island. I'm like, I probably made a hundred grand off the back of Love Island. I was fucking doing very well before I went on that show. Yeah. But people think 
you go on this show, you're going to be rich. You know, there's so many people that aren't. There's so many people that are struggling and just trying to keep their head above water. Most of them. Yeah, that's crazy because that's the perception, right? Like, um, yeah. you watch these reality shows and then you like, like you go on their Instagram, and you're like, oh my god, they got like millions of followers. They yeah. must be making so much money. <laughs> you know, that's just for the perception. It is. That's a perception. Yeah. Pe- people genuinely think that. They think you know. I remember when I first came off that that show and I was like doing some. I did really well out the forex thing. But I can remember I had like half a million, five hundred fifty followers, something like that. K followers and I can remember being like god even if I make one percent of these people I'm gonna make an absolute fortune but the thing is like people don't want to buy your shit they're interested in your life when you come off that show because they want to see what's going on but right. you know it doesn't mean that they, they've got any you're not Kylie Jenner you know mm-hmm. like you are a Z list of person coming off of a show that is going to be replaced in one year's time mm-hmm. people do not give a fuck about what you have to sell you have to actually have something that people want mm-hmm. and um yeah you, you make the mistake of thinking million followers of course i'm going to make money just not how it works Mm. there's there's so many different elements at play and like i said you get caught up in that vicious cycle where the more that you sell to people if it's not your own uh, your own brand or your own product you sell enough random shit to people eventually they're sick of you Mm. they don't want to do it so all of a sudden you don't have anything to fall back on of your own and the brand stopped working with you because none of the people buy your shit anymore it's fucking ruthless (laughs) it's absolutely (laughs) ruthless and yeah. Uh, yeah, it looks like these people are making a lot of money most of the time because, like I said, they are spending their money, all their money, to maintain that lifestyle. And also, celebrities get free shit. You know, yeah. it's different when it's like, you know, how many times do you go out for a meal in? How many? Uh, even now, I get offered free meals in Bali. You know, I think I had one the other day. I went to a lovely Vietnamese place down the road with my mum. They're like, "Do you want a free meal? Do you want to put?" Them? You're like, "Yeah, of course we do." Because why not? Yeah. But you know, like that's not me taking advantage of my audience. Like, but is people might look at that from someone that's living in Dubai. I don't know if you've been to Dubai, but if you're yeah. an influencer, you get everything for free. Mm. You can go out. I mean, other than an apartment, you get everything free. You go out and you can fucking dance the night away. You can drink as much as you want. You can eat anywhere. Most of the time, if you got more than like a hundred k followers, you'll get it for free. And it's very easy to look at that and think these people are fucking rolling. And they're not. Mm. They're not. As soon as like, God forbid, like Instagram and TikTok go down the tubes one day, because these people are not going to have anything left to rely on. Mm. And I and the, you know I've had I've, I've seen it a lot now where people do get their accounts blocked, and they're like russians especially i know there's like been a lot of russian accounts taken down because of all this shit going on and they're like oh, <laughs> what do you know <laughs> like, yeah. that's my that's my revenue that yeah, you've yeah. just taken away from me it's like putting all your eggs in one basket right for sure there needs to be strategy you need yeah. like even if you're not smart and you don't have a business mind find someone that is mm. and get them to do it for you yeah it's one thing that it's it's very early days but i'm developing with a uh a management company and that is essentially putting I'm not this isn't even a plug because it's not even nearly ready yet but it will be to essentially develop templates and framework for people when they actually do come off these shows and they actually have the ability to to essentially create a business mm. where it's like they're not just fumbling around it's like almost like a business in a box mm. solution so they come out and if they have a certain interest and they can actually get into that and it's theirs and um you know Obviously, they have to learn certain business skills, but at least they're not just coming out and being like, oh, what do I do? Mm. Um, That's yeah. smart. It's like yeah. you've got identified a gap in the market and you're capitalizing on for, it. For sure. Smart, yeah. yeah. Because if I didn't know about trading yeah. and I came off a show and someone was like, look, I'm going to do it all for you. And it's a, a trading's bad because obviously that's investments. But yeah, if someone this, clothing brands are usually a waste of time. You can't trade, but let's use it as a basic example. No one knows about fucking. If you don't know about marketing, you don't know where to get your stock from. You don't know anything about e-commerce at all. And someone comes out and says, "Look, we've got a supplier in China. We can buy stock clothing. We can put your branding on it. We've got a website ready to go. We've got a digital marketing team. It's completely ready to go. All you need to do is put your name behind it, and you'll take fifty percent." Yeah, of course. Sign mm-hmm. me up. Yeah. And it, and it makes sense to do it like that because at least yeah. these people have a fighting chance then. Mm. At least they've got something that's actually going to be theirs and they're not just going to get completely raped by these fucking brands who genuinely couldn't give a shit about them. You know, it's yeah. like you're the taste of the town. And then, yeah. you know, there's a few people that have gone to, I think uh, like Molly May, she's on, she's like the creative director now, Pretty Little Thing. And I don't know her and she's probably a very bright girl, but you can't tell me that that's not like a very heavy marketing strategy move by Pretty Little Thing. You know, because there's people with 20, 30 years experience in creative direction. Yeah. And it's, yeah, again, I'm not taking a dig at anyone, but you would think that 
there would have to be an ulterior motive behind that. But that's the kind of thing that I mean. Like there's there's a use there as long as you're relevant. The moment you become not relevant, it's a very different story. Mm. And staying relevant is is a hard thing in and of itself. It's very hard. How do you stay relevant? You've got to have a niche. Yeah. You've got to have a niche. You can't be doing that. Everyone wants to do the same shit that everyone else is doing. You're not going to stay relevant doing it that way. Mm. You know, you have to be different. You have to create a brand for yourself and it has to be one that it's very difficult for other people to do. I'm lucky. Well, I'm not lucky. I'm good at what I do. <laughs> I'm glad you said that. Yeah, I'm not fucking lucky. <laughs> but <laughs> I, you know, I made the right moves at the right times. They were pretty much down to when I planned to do them, a little bit off. I didn't get sucked up in, into it for a bit. But I definitely had the strategy in place. I, create, I, I knew that I had skills that other people didn't have. And then I built off the back of it. And the, even the businesses that I'm in now, they are byproducts of me being on that show because they could create connections. But even still, there's people that just get walked all over. You know, they get offered like a commission deal and they're not interested in taking a slice of this company. They still get used and abused. I was good that I did have a business brain and I was able to build a, a niche around not just trading, but other areas of business as well. Uh, and also travel, funny enough, because there's always something, I don't make any money from travel. Mm. Some people think I do. Some people think I'm like getting paid by these hotels. I'm not. Most of the time I pay for it myself. Mm. If a hotel offers me a, a, a really appealing deal, like I might take it. But a lot of the time it stresses me out to know that I'm going to stay in a hotel and I have to provide a certain level of exposure for them. Like it stresses right. me. I just want to relax. Yeah, yeah for sure. You know, I, I do, I can get hotel deals pretty easily, but a lot of the time, especially in Bali because it's not that expensive anyway. It's mm. just easy just to pay for it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that is just something that I genuinely enjoy. But I might get, I might do something to do with travel at some point. I don't mm. want to spin in too many places at once. Um, but yeah, that's the most important thing. A lot of people go down like um, the clothing route and they start, they will do like a deal with a brand. But again, you are not, you don't own any of that brand. Mm. You are going to get paid for as long as people are buying this shit. As soon as they stop buying it, you, you're still going to be out on your own. Still going to have to think about what you're going to do. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a nice segue now into the business side of things. Mm. Like, because you started these businesses that you're talking about. So you got, you got a coach masters, yeah. right? And then you got cafe coach, which is the cafe here. And then you're into real estate here as well. Yeah. So, so when you left, when you became, before you came to Bali, mm. were you already thinking, all right, I'm going to go to Bali and I'm going to start all these businesses? <laughs> well, no, Bali was an interesting one that I ended up here anyway, to be honest with you. Like, the, to be honest with you, I am getting into real estate here. I'm going to start building properties, but my real, my main real estate is in the UK. That's right. And care that's, homes, right? and with care homes. Yeah. Mm. Care homes is like a huge, well, it's like legacy business, really. Hopefully that'll be generational. Fingers crossed. That's such an amazing business. It's an awesome homes. business, yeah. And it's uh, it's an, it's not like nursing. It's not got like the same sort of like horrible stigma around nursing homes. It's learning disabilities, mental health. We like it's a lot of very rewarding work that we do. Um, we're based mainly around Greater London, but we are a national uh, company, so we take clients from all over the company, uh, all over the country. Um, and yeah, that's like that's nice work. I enjoy I enjoy that kind of thing. And yeah, obviously, I do want to start start building here but the coaching masters was an interesting one so i know I, you know i told you that i didn't um like doing brand deals especially after i started launching my my own products um my own brands and i was at a stage where i was transitioning from trading trading started getting really bad raps you know it was like every fucker was trying to scam someone and i kind of recognized that and i thought this is almost like a bit, little bit of a ticking time bomb and being FCA regu uh, regulated is great, but it also puts you under a lot higher scrutiny, you know, because if someone does make a complaint to the FCA, that shit doesn't, even if you're completely innocent, it's not dealt with quickly. And I thought with the level of exposure that I had and also the level of exposure that my old business partner had, Lewis, because he was dating Caroline Flack, I was like, this is a fucking ticking time bomb. I was like, because we start getting like little complaints here and there as well so i was like you know what i've had a really good run out of this but i i'm gonna back out i'm gonna just uh, get rid of whatever i'm doing i'm gonna get rid of the the, the shares that i had in that and, and move on to the next thing and it was wasn't really i didn't have any hard feelings about that i, I was yeah that sort of done with it i've been staring at a, a chart for like six years at this point i was like yeah not really that interested in doing it anymore and um i was I'd met a girl as well. We were engaged, believe it or not. And I got approached by Lewis and Liam. Actually, it was Lewis originally. Uh, Lewis, Raymond Taylor, Lewis, uh, Liam Collins, my business partners now. And um, it was the usual shit to a certain extent. They're like, oh, we'd love to work with you, blah, blah, blah. And um, 
I think the first message I just ignored it because I was like, it's going to be the same thing. And then they, the second message was more interesting. It was talking about um, nurture sequences, commission splits, long-term partnerships. They sent me like some literature about their company and I looked into it and I didn't know what coaching was. I had no idea about coaching at the time. Um, still, still debatable. Was this, this like, was this like three years ago, four years ago? 2019, yeah. Okay, yeah. To, uh, yeah. Middle, middle of right. 2019. And um, it sounded interesting. And they were like, look, we want to come and meet you. We want to like run you through like a pitch. And I was like, okay. And they came down to meet me. I was in Essex. They came down to meet me at the time. And uh, they were good. They were really interesting guys. Yeah. Like you could tell Lewis is uh, probably a genius in the scientific description of what a genius is. Like he's, uh, you know, he's not the most socially good person <laughs> you know we clash me and lewis quite yeah. a bit but like he's a fucking genius he's got mm. his head screwed on mm. and you know a lot of the success of this company is due to him because he's just fucking relentless with how much he works and how he just doesn't accept sort of any any kind of failure whatsoever so yeah i'd met him and i saw that in him straight away and um they were they ran some numbers past me and i thought yeah they're a bit optimistic with what they're saying and then i met liam who is probably the nicest guy in the world that you'll ever meet. He, you know, when I first met him, he's one of them people that's so nice. You're like, this guy's full of shit. And then two years <laughs> later, I'm like, yeah, he's still that nice. He's still he's like a genuine thing. Um, I heard both their backstories, which are fucking phenomenal backstories. Um, you know, lots of trials. Lewis has been through like quite a lot through criminal records and being in and out of prison. Obviously, obviously just like potential channeled in the wrong direction. Definitely. Because he's such a bright lad. And, uh, and Liam as well, just with like a very interesting history. He used to be uh, like an actor. He used to be Tom Hardy's body double for all the oh, really? Batman films. Again, he had like a very interesting story about his dad committing suicide um, and how that sort of led him towards coaching in order to deal with it. Um, very interesting guys. And yeah, they were basically, they were talking about collaborations in a way that no one else had spoke to me about before. And they were like, look, we want to bring you in. We want you to know about the products because obviously if you're promoting, we want you to be a part of it. We want you to do one of the courses. Um, and we want to do a nurture sequence for your audience over like two months and, you know, constant plugging away. And then after that, we're going to do a product launch and we're going to do a commission split. And I think I took 40%, something like that. Flew me on to Monaco. I was in the South France anyway, but we all met in Monaco and we filmed a load of content. And it was, it was like, really, it's so cringy now. It's funny to see how quick you have to look back to see how quick you're actually growing because this wasn't actually that long ago. And it was like, they were pushing something like an influencer lifestyle and relating it to coaches. It's fucking the cringiest thing I've ever seen in my life <laughs> looking back at it now. Even the videos that we had, like, I look back, oh my God, it looks, <laughs> looks like a rap video. I was like, let's see. And, uh, but yeah, I was interested at the time because yeah. uh, I can respect when I know people really do have business minds and they really have a, a direction and also like a very good vision as well. They're not just doing it to sort of make money. They were talking about helping people. I like that. I've just come out of the trading industry, which is like renowned for being the complete opposite mm-hmm. and sort of being quite um, yeah, relentless and people losing money and shit like that. So yeah, we did it. We filmed some content. We did this launch, made some very good money. It was like fucking, I forget how much I made, but it was very much worth my while for just doing posts for a couple of months. Mm. And uh, then we sort of parted ways because I, I don't know why, why we parted ways. I think it was probably, um, I think my relationship was going for a bit of a funny one at the time. Uh, and yeah, I just wasn't really in the headspace to be diving into new things. And then me and this girl broke up uh, this this engagement that I had went tits up <laughs> rather phenomenally as well as they seemed to always for me and um, yeah I ended up in uh, Thailand at a health retreat I just went out there I was like I spent about a month drinking in London I was like fuck me I need to sort my life out I'm going to go and just lock myself away for two weeks uh, went to a really nice health retreat in Hua Hin and um, Lewis gave me a call and he's like oh I'm in Bali he's like why don't you come over to Bali and I was like yeah alright I was like once I'm done here I'll pop over and I'll say hello come over here and then I was living with him which was kind of weird he was like why don't you just live with me oh, okay <laughs> I moved in with him for like a week and then you know as minds do when they're sort of on the same page we started like bouncing off each other we started thinking of different ways we could make money and different projects we could work on and uh, yeah I was like um, let's do a project let's like start launching some bits and make some more money and I was like that's pretty good and then um, at the time they were paying still paying me 40% commission for every single uh 
every single transaction that I brought through their company, they paid me 4%. They were also based in the UK for some fucking reason because they're an online company. So they were also paying corporation tax 20%, VAT 20%. Um, so they were being left with very little money by the end of it. And uh, we had like an open discussion and we talked about um, me not getting my commission and me just coming on board, me taking some shares in the company. And we had to talk about what I would bring to the table. And I said, well, for a start, I can relocate you so you're not going to be able to have to pay any more tax because there's an online international based company so i had all the tax experience from hong kong so i migrated the company over to hong kong it's a very tax efficient structure now obviously the the, the taxes that do need to be legally paid are completely paid so I'll throw that out there <laughs> but it's a it's yeah. an, it's very hard for startups especially in the uk to yeah. make any fucking money you can get a grant here and there but essentially there's there's always someone's hand taking money out of your pot yeah usually HMRC. Mm. Um, and it's just, it's just one of the things. So yeah, the, the, stru- the system is designed in a way that people can take advantage of it if they have the wearable to do it. Not even take advantage of it. These loopholes are not, well, they're not even loopholes. They're just plain as day. If you're not in the UK, you don't pay UK tax. It's fair enough. Um, so yeah, we, I, uh, I helped them do that. And then they brought me on board. And I thought that these guys knew each other a lot longer than they did because they were like, felt like best friends, but they'd only met each other like six weeks before they met me which is fucking crazy. Wow. So yeah, like even though I'm technically an investor, because I did invest 25 grand, they wanted yep. to uh, see that I have some skin in the game. They didn't just want to give me shares and then me mm. be like, anyway, guys, you've got this. So yeah, I stuck 25 grand in, which has been an extremely good investment considering. Um, and uh, yeah, we sort of, we started building and it was it was an interesting working relationship working with them too. Lewis is, like I said, he's difficult to work, but he knows it as well. Sorry, Lewis, but you are, you're difficult to work. <laughs> Um, but again, we would not be where we are now at the rate that we've been being able to get here without Lewis. And I can say that. I'm big enough to say that. Lewis is a fucking genius. Liam is also the most... He's the reason that people stay. Lewis is good at getting people through the door. He's great with marketing. Liam is the reason that people stay because he obviously is just like... He's this charismatic guy who's just like caring he's very involved in the community he's very involved in like a lot of the content that goes out mm. funnily enough i've ended up in the finance role uh finance and legal which is actually where i prefer but yeah it's, it's interesting because when i first came on i think they wanted me to originally when we did business i was there to bring traffic because i was a celebrity That's right, yeah. but now i have the more sort of like uh behind the scenes role i'm right. not customer facing at all which, <laughs> which is really funny yeah, yeah. i'm on some of the courses um but yeah this is where i sort of feel more comfortable this is where i'm like my superpowers lie mm. and the company has just exploded it's just gone mad so i met them in 2019 in 2020 we quadrupled in size the com- the com- keep on saying country the company just is probably fueled by the pandemic in fact almost certainly people at home wanted to learn new skills um obviously feeling a little bit uncertain about their futures uh having that spare time as well so yeah we quadrupled and we've doubled in size every year after that the com- company has just gone absolutely mad we've got a team of 60 working for us right now Damn. the com- the company's on on, on target to turn pro- i mean yeah we've had some estimations but based on the figures now we're probably on target to turn over about four mil this year which wow. is like phenomenal yeah considering it's a three-year-old company um and uh yeah we've started just dipping into new things now we've uh we met some people at the start of the year who were talking to us about investments and the beauty thing beautiful thing about tcm is that we don't actually need investment like we grow regardless we've got like we have an eight times return ad on our uh, return on our ad spend so we know we put 100 grand in we're getting 800 grand out we just know it so it's not like too much of a gamble for investors and we realized this quite early on. So we started taking on investors start of the year to really get a, um, well, we want to do an aggressive scale up. We want to take this thing to the moon. We've got like apps being developed. Well, the app is already live. That's right, yeah. The coaching um, app, right? Coaching app, yeah. It's yeah. only internally within our community, but it will go live to the public soon. And also moving into the VR space. So we actually want to take this very heavily into the tech space as well because um, we see that's where the future of coaching is. The rest of coaching is like, it's fucking stagnant, you know? You're talking these old fossil, not in Bali, obviously everyone's very current and progressive and it's great, but the actual, especially in places like England, you are talking like, you know, like someone that's a bit older with like round glasses, like, oh, come and sit on my chaise long and tell me about your mum and, right, right. <laughs> and shit like that. It's, and um, there, there's these institutions in place that it's an unregulated industry, but they have these ancient institutions in place that feel like they're regulators and they make sure that the industry doesn't move into directions that they don't understand. We told them 
that we there's a company called the ANLP and they are one of the unofficial they regulate it but they're they're not official so they're not government based they have no powers whatsoever and we wanted to do like a partnership with them we approached them and uh, we said you know we want to do coaching but we want to do it online this is before the pandemic and like no you can't do it online like this is like unethical and like we won't support this kind of thing so we ended up doing business with one of the different authorities because it's important to have like some names behind you for people to feel more comfortable even though they're not legally obliged and uh, it was funny because they completely poo-pooed the idea of being uh, of it being online and then obviously fast forward six months to uh, the pandemic and it's like fuck everything needs to go online. So they were all scrambling around trying to get their systems online. Meanwhile, we've been doing it for a year already. And um, yeah, that's why we we took our place in the market. And we're we're the fastest growing. We're not the biggest, but we are the fastest growing coaching platform in the world. And uh, that growth is still going. And um, yeah, it is duly part to us just kind of being a little bit of a head of curve. Now that probably was luck because obviously no one can foresee the pandemic. It's good timing though, right? Timing. It's got the right, right idea, right? Execution for and sure. planning, all that. For sure, yeah. So we want to take it one step further now. You know, We yeah. want to talk about virtual reality. I mean, virtual reality, how it is now, is not suitable for, like, we do high-ticket courses. It's probably not suitable. If you used, like, an Oculus before, it's, I haven't used it actually. I mean, My not, friend's got one, but I didn't. I, yeah, I didn't want to get like, sucked into the metaverse. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's, I mean, it's cool, but you don't want to wear it for more than like half an hour. You yeah. start feeling sick. Yeah. Like I need to take it off, and also you're like smashing up furniture around yourself <laughs> and shit. Um, so yeah, it's not good for courses, but it is good for coaching scenarios. So like, imagine you want to have a coach, but you want to be anonymous. You don't, you know. We and you are having a conversation right now about you know some reasonably personal stuff, but had I been a different type of person, I might not want to divulge this stuff because right. you know who I am. Mm. So you can have completely anonymous coaching sessions through VR mm. uh, in a completely, in whatever setting you want. You do it on the bloody moon if you want, um, <laughs> which is great for some reason. Also, personal speaking. A lot of people don't like personal speaking. You put yourself up on front of a, an entire audience of 10,000 people if you want and give like a speech and train your mind to actually get used to it. You can give a speech at your own funeral. You know, a lot of people, a lot of, one of the coaching questions uh, or the scenarios yeah. that people put themselves in what would you say at your own funeral right. and um there's all these different scenarios it's like an endless plethora of yeah. some really exciting uh pathways for mm. coaching to go and it's good that it's going that way now as well because there's no barriers now it's not like anyone's like oh we still need to be doing this in person people are like hey, okay this needs to like evolve mm. otherwise they're going to get left behind they are left behind yeah, that's powerful and congratulations yeah. by Thanks, the way on the growth yeah, yeah. man that's amazing like because yeah. that's, that's multiple right so like you're doing four million a year so that's like what if you were to sell it, that's a 10x multiple. So it's like yeah. valued at 40 million. We, we, we want like, well, we've been valued at 25 million okay. now. Right. So that's based on a growth model valuation. Okay. Um, so obviously there's a, there's a lot of ways to value a company. Yeah. Um, pre, so because we are, once you start getting into big, big, pro, we are profitable, we're a profitable company, but we're still considered like startup we're still considered like at the seed phase so the valuation is done based on revenue once you start getting into profit big big profit that's when um they start basing the valuation on profit so it will it will fluctuate basically but yeah right now everything that we make gets invested back into the company is it we, i mean even me lewis and liam we've only just started taking a wage from the company for, mm. for nearly three years we haven't seen a penny out of it Wow. So everything's been reinvested. And it's all right for me because I've got other business interests. I have no idea how them two have been surviving. <laughs> We've been eating like cat food and like <laughs> living under a bridge somewhere. But no, I'm joking. Um, what but, about the workload though? Like, because that's because my experience working with partners is inevitably one partner gets like resentful with the other partner because it's not like a true split. There's yeah. always one party doing more than the other. So how, how do you for guys sure. deal with that? Yeah, that's an interesting that's, a, that's an interesting observation because there's definitely something that we've hit, like we have hit that a lot. Now, Lewis understands that he will do the majority of the work because, he, I mean, we've had to tell Lewis to take weekends off. Lewis didn't even want to <laughs> take weekends off. And Li Liam's got a family, you know, and like for me, I've, I've been doing this for 10 years. Like I don't, I'm at the stage now where I don't want to be like putting myself into like a you know, a bloody, I don't want to have an aneurysm before I'm 40, you know, mm. I want to like keep, this is where I should be enjoying some of the, some of the stuff that I've created. So we're very open about that. Lewis, yeah. Lewis likes to have a team around and we all complement each other's weak, uh, weaknesses uh, and strengths. Um, so, and it's also reflected. I mean, like Lewis and Liam, they 
definitely Lewis definitely has the majority of the workload because he wants to be involved in everything. Doesn't have to be. Lewis is our CEO. He's also definitely probably the, you know, he would be the head of marketing as well. But he wants to involve himself in every aspect of the company. But that is also this is his his vision. He calls himself a visionary. That's what he calls himself because it's like yeah, like this is yeah. <laughs> right. so it does work so you're complementing each other's weaknesses and for sure yeah you're, you're but, all in your roles but yeah but I'm very open as well like that I uh, you know my shareholding within the company is not as much as theirs I also have other business interests and uh, I also don't take as much money as the two guys you know mm. like there was a, a conversation that happened where we all were gonna like take some of that money and I was like guys like I'm not gonna I don't want to be as involved in that side of things to the point where like I'm not able to still enjoy my life. So yeah, things have changed with me. I used to be very sort of like, I don't give a fuck how long I'm working, what I'm doing. I need to be like making like as much money as possible. Whereas now, like I understand that my health is much more important. Mm. I want to enjoy some of my life. To, you know, yeah, you're one year older than me, two years older than me. A couple of years, yeah. Yeah, I don't know if you got it when you get to 30, but there is still something that sort of trees you like, oh yeah, like I'm it's kind of weird another 30 years I'm going to be 60 I've got like you know I see my parents I see them getting like a lot older every time I see them now I've just had my my last grandparent die as well uh, that's right it's just like, a couple of weeks ago right? just a couple of weeks yeah. ago and yeah it's sort of like oh yeah this is like we are all mortal you know this stuff mm. is going quick like we're all going to die one day you don't really know and like what's the point in building this life if I'm not going to enjoy it so so yeah um it's great to be in business with them guys. And obviously I do work like a fucking dog when there's shit like funding going on. Finance and legal is not an enjoyable role whatsoever. Like, I mean, I, I like it because it's what I'm, I'm good at. But at the same time, it doesn't matter if there's, it doesn't matter if I've got a team of 10 people, I still need to be very much involved, mm. especially when there's there's funding going on. But we're, of, we're all of the same opinion that like, you know, once we get ourselves to a place post crowdfund, oh, we're doing a crowdfund right now as well. Um, yes. Uh, like post investments and stuff like that we want to make sure that we have people come in to do the the trench work that we're doing right now mm. and we all want to just be in the position we still want to be involved in the company but we don't want to be like working 12 hour days because yeah i mean like right. sometimes i have not that much to do but other times if it needs to be done i will you know i'll be in my office 12 hours the whole day i'll just be smashing through it lewis probably longer he's probably not even sleeping no he's like um, but yeah, after that, we want to take, get people to take over a lot of that work and we want to concentrate on the very high level stuff. We want to make sure that this com company is going to the fucking moon. You know, mm -hmm. I want to be able to sit with a whiteboard for like three, four hours a day and just think, how can I take this company to the next level? What are we not doing? Because right now when there's too much going on, it's difficult to have that real creative time. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, we, you know, we, it's one conversation that we've never had, like, are you working more? Why aren't you working as much as I have? We're pretty good at that. But because I think we're all quite transparent about it. Yeah. You know, like... Communication, right? It's communication, yeah. yeah. Like, I'm... I, I, I'm if they want to... if Well, I could work as much as Lewis, but you're going to have to give me another 15% <laughs> of the company at least. So... <laughs> no, but it, it's... Uh, obviously, we all keep the ship flowing yeah. um, as, as much as possible. That's and cool. like, luckily, within... Finance is a full-time job, but legal, it's... You know, it's neither here nor there. There might be something that comes out that requires a lot of effort. But yeah, ultimately, it's a good role for me to be in consider the, considering the amount of work that it requires of me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you've got Cafe Coach now. So yeah. how long have you had that for? We actually opened it up during the pandemic. I think we opened it up in 2020. Is it? Yeah. Oh, God, no. It must have been 21. It must have been 2020. Would, would you ever have imagined that you have your own restaurant? No, not really. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, that was an interesting one as well. So technically, it's a subsidiary of TCM. Okay. Um, and as Lewis would say, it's an offline sales funnel. It's, a be it's beautiful to be a part of the community here. But the main reason for that was to create something that people could... Uh, not just go and get something to eat, but they could then see like, oh, the coaching masters, what's that? Or they can come to like a, a free workshop and kind of just get into our ecosystem a little bit. Um, because yeah, I mean, we've had a lot of course sales through the, the cafe. We've actually had two investors come through the cafe as well. People oh, that nice. come for a coffee and end up investing money with us, which is crazy. Wow. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the potential is there. And also it's a part of our overall vision. You know, mm. we want the, uh, we want to be able to, coach people we want to continue to sell like these high ticket courses but we also want to have the the app we want to have the vr we want to have the tech but we also want a physical presence because like um i don't know when the transition is but up to a certain point companies that you see online don't seem that reliable 
you know like i don't know what i mean unless you're apple or amazon or something like that you see a, a company online and it's almost like god are these like these like online hustle dudes like you know do i trust them with my money but i feel like once you have like a, a physical asset somewhere that's attributed to your business you know like that it almost becomes a little bit more legitimate it becomes a little bit more real there's there's yeah. something physical that you can go into and like yeah, touch it and, certainly does have that effect because i went to the cafe coach a few times actually yeah i don't get it boy it's super busy now like i yeah, can't get in there now even, it's so I, busy even, <laughs> even you can't get into can't your own restaurant in, yeah. which is good <laughs> yeah, yeah it's good good problems still, it does annoy me at times. <laughs> <laughs> so there's um these cards on the table right and it's like all these amazing questions like coaching questions yeah. and that that just that whole concept of going into that place and it's like oh that's a, this is part of an online business yeah and it just exactly. makes me trust the brand even more right yeah. exactly yeah. and uh you know again that's lewis you know lewis is he knows psychology he knows marketing he knows mm. how people think and it's completely right people go in there and it feels like it's part of this much I mean, it is part of a much bigger thing but on the grand scheme of things we are still like a relatively small company but yeah mm. i mean you go in there and you're like wow these guys like they've got like offices and like these digital nomad hospitals we know what we want to open them all over as well we want them in chiang mai tulum maybe uh Maybe even you know some some of the digital nomad hotspots in Eastern Europe as well. So mm -hmm. depending how this war goes, <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> we'll see. yeah, and, and the yeah. upcoming uh, depression, well, yeah, yeah, recession, depression. Yeah, we're going to make sure people can still afford the courses. Yeah, right, right, <laughs> but still. Yeah. So, so let's transition now. So now you're you're going to be starting real estate in uh, Bali. Yeah. Are yeah, you? Sure. What's the plans for that? Well, originally I just wanted to uh, build myself somewhere. Yeah. Because. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I just got absolutely slaughtered by my landlord <laughs> for the rent. <laughs> so during the pandemic, I wanted to build somewhere, but I, in the back of my mind, I was like, we did it with the calf, we took a risk. Um, but yeah, in the back of my mind, I was like, God, if what if they just boot us all out one day? Because mm -hmm. it was like, we couldn't get in sometimes without certain paperwork. I didn't have a kid's house at the start of the pandemic as well. I wasn't even allowed back in. And yeah, there was always something in the back of my mind that the government here is not that reliable and they could make a very impulsive, rash decision that could fuck it all up. So yeah, after the pandemic, I was like, right, we're going to build somewhere to live. My landlord was stuck up my rent like 300%, something like that. So I was like, all right, I'll do it for another year, but it doesn't really make much sense really paying like this much money because like against everything that I fucking believe in. Mm. Um, so yeah, I, uh, I started like looking into it more and it's, um, it's very lucrative out here. You know, there's like, it's an inch, it's in a bit of a world of its own, the real estate market out here back in England. If you build a house, you can probably make 30% on top, something like that. And obviously it's a lot more tax efficient here as well. There's a lot you can do. Um, but out here, you you know, you can you're making sixty percent on top. You know, if you build a house for like a hundred grand, you're going to be able to sell it for at least three hundred grand. And it's like the margins were just like I was like looking at it, I was like this can't be right. And then I was like talking to other people and talking, and like yeah, it's like you know, it's the real thing. And I was like, but it's all you can buy freehold out here. It's a little bit more difficult, but obviously most people buy leasehold. I'm like you're telling me that there's people dropping like two million pounds on a villa that they're only going to own for the next twenty years. And they're like yeah all the time yeah like, it's crazy right why because there's, you know, there's like a lot of russians here now and like mm. a lot of these russians have some fucking really big money and it's like for me i can't ever imagine a stage where two million quid is not going to seem like a, a big amount of money mm. hopefully one day you know <laughs> would um but uh yeah it's, it's a lot of the guys that are coming over it's just like and it's, it's the same in dubai you know the property market's gone insane and i think that is also fueled by the amount of Russians that are coming in who do just have like a lot of dosh to spend. Um, so yeah, I was like thinking about it and I was like, God, so okay, so if I'm gonna spend half a million quid on uh, some land and like a house and I can sell it for, I think the one that I was, that had the plans drawn up for was priced at like 2.5 million. And they were like, trust me, the more excessive that you can be with it, the more you'll sell it for. Don't just make it a normal mansion. They're like, stick a fucking helipad on the roof and shit like that. I was like, wow, right? So yeah, the plan now is to build, uh, the first development that I'm going to do is um, a plot of four, four villas that's going to be up in Kadungu um, because it just makes more sense to build up there. It's like half the price, it's 10 minutes away. Mm. Um, there's also uh, a crowd that I'm thinking of doing some business with who are doing who are right on the beach in Kadungu uh, near you know where potato heads land is it's quite yeah. quite close to that 
and uh, they're looking for partners to come in on, but they've already got like investors lined up and they just want like a uh, similar situation to how I met Lucy Liam. They want some good exposure. They want some some advice on bringing on investors uh, from like a social media point of view as well. So yeah, there's like a few exciting opportunities there, but that's something that I can deal with and I can actually enjoy. And I feel like that might be a transition for me into a more slow paced part of my life where I'm mm. making money, but it's not as like, what am I doing? I'm like rushing around. I need to be making right. money. Yeah, yeah. Cause yeah, I'm at the stage now where uh, I could like, I can take it a little bit more easy now. Yeah. yeah. Just focusing on investments, long-term exactly. investments, right? Yeah. And that's it. Like I said, with TCM now, we're doing, we're doing a crowdfund and uh, yeah, that's like our main focus. And it feels a little bit stressful, but once you've done it once, it's always like easier after that. And it's, mm. yeah, we're going to get TCM to a place in the next, like we want to yeah. like 27 exit. We want to take this thing to like 500 million in five yeah. years. Yeah. I mean, sounds optimistic, but in three years we're worth 25 mil. And I think if we continue with that trajectory, it's not unrealistic. Especially with the new wave of VR as well. Like yeah. time in that as well. That's sure. going to propel you as well. For sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, like we are definitely uh, like huge fans of like staying current with everything that's going on. You know, there's no point in going against the grain with it. Technology and things like, I know it's scary, you know, metaverse and all this shit. Like we don't want to make things too impersonal, but there's definitely a lot to be said for that kind of technology, just in terms of the innovation that it can cause within the industry. Mm. You know, there's, there's just like an unlimited, untapped potential there. Yeah. Uh, like even like the examples that I gave you earlier, you know, it's just like, it just seems like a complete no brainer. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So you had these goals, you had five goals when you were 18 <laughs> years old. And I'd like to touch on this because this is so important. Like this is this is like a topic that I like to geek out on a lot. Yeah. Is the whole like, I'll be happy when I achieve all yeah. these goals. And you had five goals, um, and then you're like, you achieved them. Did. And then what happened? <laughs> uh, how do you know that? Where have you seen that? <laughs> I did my research. Maybe I'm from Love Island. Who knows? <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, so uh, I think, uh, like, everyone, when they're younger, like, you look at, there's people that you aspire to be like. Yeah. And I'm, I wouldn't say unfortunately, because it is good, but we are, this is a social media age. And even before Instagram came in big, there was still like, there was like a lot of people that I would see on TV and it would be like, wow, I wonder what aspect of their life has made it to be this good. And obviously that's assuming that you know that they're happy, which evidently, you know, people like Mike, maybe they're not. You never really know what's going on. But yeah, the instant connection you can make is this dude's got fucking a lot of money and he's got these cars, he's got this, and it's like, makes sense, makes sense. That must be the connector. Um, Also, like, Bless my dad, I love him. But when I was having a hard time in school, uh, I can actually, I remember him talking to, my dad is a hardcore businessman, but I can remember him saying to me like, Johnny's like, trust me, in 10 years, he's like, it just as long as you were making a shitload of money, he's like, none of this other shit matters. Mm. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I think he's right. So like, it kind of ingrained it into my mind that like money and this material stuff was important. And to, a, to an extent it is. But yeah, I had this list and you probably know better than I do it now, but I know that I wanted like a, a, a Rolls Royce or Ferrari. I wanted like some fast car. I wanted to fly private. Yeah. Um, there was like a lot of very uh, superficial things I had on that list. And I actually reached it probably relatively quickly. And like the thing, the last thing on the list was the Rolls Royce. Because mm-hmm. I had that roller when I was like 27 years old. Um, and I was going to buy a Ferrari and I went down to like a dealership in... Uh, Fuck was it? It was like Brighton or something. And this dude just specialised in supercars. I went down to look at the Ferrari and this guy just fucking sold me hard and he was like, this is the daddy of all cars, this Rolls Royce. And I was like, fuck it, I'm going to get it. So I got it and the defining moment was just getting in it and just like, I was like, but is that it? So we're like, <laughs> where's all the fireworks? Like, where's the music playing? And yeah, it was just like, it was a, it was anticlimactical. That was the best way to do it. I got in and I was just like, it's just a fucking car, isn't it? And I used to drive around and I, to me, I felt like a bit of a belly driving it, you know? People kind of look at me like, oh, fuck <laughs> off, mate. I couldn't park it anywhere. It was huge. Mm. Um, and like, you know, I was always scared of someone scratching it. I, had, I bought a smart car at the same time. And I used to drive that smart car every day. I'd take that Rolls Royce out once in a blue moon. I crashed it once as well on my, on my driveway. <laughs> I bought, I like got these telescopic uh bollards installed on my driveway because so I thought I've got Rolls Royce I need to make sure no one can fucking nick it and uh, the Rolls Royce used to park right in front of it but the Rolls Royce hood was higher than the bollards one day I just got in it and just drove like two centimetres forward 
just completely wrapped it around this bollard. And it cost me like fucking 15 grand to get the bloody thing in place. It wasn't even worth to put it through the insurance. It's like a bit of metal. Or well, the, the excess you have to pay. Oh, exactly. The premiums. It, honestly, it wasn't even worth yeah. doing. Um, so yeah, there was like, that. it was just an anticlimactic. I, I feel like you can, people have told me that my whole life. Like, trust me, money don't make you happy. And I was like, fuck off. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Shut up, <laughs> old man. <laughs> but the truth is, it does. It can provide you what you want. You just need to have like what you really want aligned in your mind. If it's not, yeah, sure. then you're just going to be forever snatching at things, just hoping mm. that they're going to fill this hole that inevitably won't be filled mm. because you don't have a fucking clue what you want. Mm. You know, you think you know what you want, but actually what you're doing is just being told what you want. You know, mm. you see someone with like something nice and you think I will be happy if I have that, but you fucking won't. Mm. And uh, I love fast cars. And like, you know, if I'm at a position where I live back in the UK again, which I absolutely will not ever. So it's a very sort of loose scenario. I will have a nice car again, but I definitely won't have it as like a, this will not be like a defining moment for me. I won't make it a defining moment either. I won't like give myself up like, oh my God, I can't believe it. This is it. I've made mm. it. Cause it's just like, you're, you're setting yourself up for disappointment. Mm. I need to be happy. I need to be like, very, very happy in my own life. I need to make sure that I wake up and don't have anxiety. I need to make sure that like, you know, my family are happy. I need to make sure that I'm in a good relationship. I need to make sure that I'm eating healthy. I'm getting enough exercise. My mind's clear. That shit I know now is just like, it's the only thing really that's important because it, it makes the other shit function. Mm, um, and yeah, when you're tw in your twenties, fuck it. Like you don't ever think about shit. You're like, but yeah, as you, I hate talking about myself like I'm an old man, but yeah, as you sort of do get a bit older, you realize like, yeah, like you're just you're not invincible. You need to really like enjoy the time with your, the people that you love and just make sure you're really getting as much value out of life. Um, I could sit and work myself to the bone and I, you know, I did a lot when I was younger. Uh, and, um, I don't really see, I had a great life when I was younger. It was fucking awesome. So I yeah. don't really see it like, but I spent a lot of time in front of a computer, like yeah. trading and shit like that. Um, but yeah, like doing that now would just seem like a, such a waste of life. I, mean, I wouldn't want to get to 40 and be like, oh fuck, I didn't really do much in my thirties. Like, I want to make sure that my enjoyment out of life is a priority over everything. And luckily the two go hand in hand because the more that I enjoy my life and the more that I put them aspects first, inevitably the better I am with my work, the better I am uh, sort of making these kind of connections that do lead into very lucrative business deals. Mm. Um, I see myself and Lewis and Liam as business partners, of course, and I actually see myself as one of the founders because it was such early days. Um, but it doesn't take away that this was the, definitely the most lucrative investment I've ever made in my life. Like mm. turned 25 grand into 2.5 million Two and a half years. Yeah. So it's like Mate, that's hundred X. Exactly. Yeah. Amazing. So it's like you can't can't turn your nose up at that. Like yeah. it, it's brilliant. But yeah, uh, I wouldn't be if I'm stressed. I'm not going to do any work. I'm mm. not going to do it well. True. Yeah, it's going to fuck it up. That's pretty generic stuff I'm saying now. I know like a lot of people say it, but it's fucking true. There's people at home now as well. Like, I'm going to go, shut up. Old <laughs> you fucking arse. Well, they probably wouldn't up. be watching this far. Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you did to Camilla. I love you, bastard. <laughs> well, it's nice to see the evolution, right? Like, that's, yeah. that's why, like, from where you were, like, you know, from growing, growing up in Essex, going to Hong Kong, starting the business, learning trading, and then going into Love Island, well, the Russia part as well, <laughs> uh, Budapest, and then going into Love Island, and and then like coming out to Bali, and you know, doing all these businesses, and humbling your well, not humbling yourself. That's the wrong. That's the wrong phrase. But just you know, just evolving. You yeah. know, as a, as a man, and understanding what's really important in life. And then now, talk about real quick your relationship. So so how first of all, how has being with Simone? She, helped you evolve as a man how has that changed you i'm just curious i feel like there's still a big part of me now that feels like i might not have made that evolutionary step if i didn't meet simone mm. because like again even when before i came out to bali like i was still in that sort of london world so when i in my old relationship i was living in london for two years i fucking hated every minute of being back there but yeah i was just getting back into that sort of that very enclosed lifestyle where you know, i was working in the city and like i was going to see my trading partners in morgate and uh, they would just go out every night and have a drink and, and shit like that and yeah i didn't really know what i wanted to do it was very do you know what? It was like very simple questions that Simone just kind of like put forward to me. Like, what do you actually want to do if you weren't really that worried about like money and shit like that? What would you actually want to be doing? And I was like, you know what? I just love, there's no better feeling for me than just traveling, like seeing new shit. Like I love an adventure. I love 
going to do shit that I haven't done before. Mm. Bali used to give me that. It's changed a little bit now, but like, you know, I used to come here and be like, I'm in the fucking rainforest. It's awesome, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, that kind of like new, fresh, fresh feeling. That's why the majority of my money now goes towards traveling. Not the majority of my money, the majority of my disposable income, right. you know, that'll go towards traveling. I always want to be doing stuff like that. But Simone is the one that sort of helped me see that. She helped me sort of strip down a lot of my ego uh, and kind of realize that I should be. I should be focusing on stuff that brings me joy rather than stuff that brings sort of attention from other people. Because mm. I'm, I'm a fucking, I love attention. Of course I do. Like I'm a, I'm, I've always been a little bit of a show off with, with shit, like when I've had cars and shit like that. And it's, I don't know. Yeah, it's like an inevitable part of being on TV. You sort of pick up, you retain a lot of that. And, uh, but that's not me anymore. It is like, it's a lot more stripped down. I love when I go on holiday, even like the pictures that I post, I see it more of like, like art, you know, it's not art. It's a stretch saying it's They're art. very nice pictures you yeah, post. Thank you. <laughs> but yeah, like I'm not making money out of that and yeah. it's not a dick swing. I'm not here like, oh, I'm doing this. Some people think it is, but it's not like, I just enjoy doing it. I enjoy showing people like the beauty of like the stuff that we're doing yep. and like the adventures we're having. And, um, you know, Simone, she's like, she's the most sort of grounded person you'll probably ever meet. Mm. She's completely the opposite of any other girl that I've ever been with. Mm. Um, I typically have always gone for very superficial sort of very angry women. <laughs> I don't know why. It's nice at first. Yeah, then it yeah, stops yeah. being nice after like six months, but no. Um, yeah, she's very grounded and it's, uh, it's very, she's always there to add another perspective She's not argumentative with things. She 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 won't like. She'll call me up on certain things because I can be a fucking real pain in the ass to like live with for sure. And uh, instead of like having a go at me and us getting into an argument, she'll call me up on things and she'll bring it into perspective. And it's just she's just a wonderful human. You know what I mean? She's just like a really good human. Exactly what I needed. Definitely not what I thought I needed. But yeah, it's just like I know, I've never had this much fulfillment out of a, a relationship before. Wow, yeah. that's amazing. Yeah, because I was going to ask you that because you just mentioned how you go, you used to go for angry women, yeah. and Simone's the opposite to that. She's so how, how did how did that attraction happen at the start then? Yeah, it's um, <laughs> I actually had some coaching around this as well. Someone was like, "Why do you reckon you go for angry women?" I was like, oh, "I don't know." And they're like, "What's your mum like?" And I was like, oh, "I'm not fucking getting into this. I'm not getting into this now." <laughs> Um, but yeah, no, I'm joking. Uh, but yeah, so me and Simone met. I had just come out of this very devastating uh, breakup. And the engagement, right? The engagement, yeah. yeah. And it was like, it was something that I tried to keep. I was still very much in the public eye and I tried to keep it very out of the public eye. I still today haven't made any sort of public mention of it or anything like that, but my ex had very different stories. And she like posted a picture of herself wearing a wedding dress, crying on her thing. Oh, I was what, what is going on? <laughs> it was devastating. So... Yeah. So was that the lowest you mentioned before? You haven't really had any lows, but that is was that the lowest of your? Because yeah, even point? then, even then, it was it was weird. It was like it was horrible that when the relationship was over. But like we had had probably about like three four months of like not very good time. I was done. I was ch I checked out. I was so happy when it was over. It was like uh, we had this this wedding planned, and there was I own businesses with my family. The divorce system in. England, it's not the nicest thing to talk about, but obviously when I have family assets tied up in it, there had to be a conversation around like the marriage. It was There was a, not a, of a huge level of uh, mediation coming from her side. She didn't really want to meet in the middle on anything because I, you know, it's very difficult. There's a lot of mechanics to it. And um, essentially, I didn't want to get like married, married. And it's a fucking horrible thing. And there's going to be women at home as well thinking like, oh, bastard probably sorry but yeah like when there was oh I, I was bringing a lot to the table in terms of that there wasn't and i'm not it's not nothing against her but there wasn't anything coming to the table i was risking a lot entering an arrangement that i didn't really give a shit about because i don't want to i don't i'm not religious i'm not uh it doesn't matter to me to have like that official title so i was like change your last name, let's have a ceremony if you want it, let's do whatever is going to make you happy. All I care about is that we're in love, we're happy, and, and that's it, I don't need to get married. And if it's going to like jeopardize my relationship with my family, I was like, I'd rather just not do it. And that became like a huge issue. So we, we had, again, aggressive woman, and we had like fucking just a horrible few months. And yeah, by the time that it actually ended, I was like, thank fucking God. I was like, it's the best thing. But it didn't end there, it fucking dragged on crazy. That's why I left, that's why I went to this health retreat as well, because it was just like, 
just followed me around absolutely everywhere that I went. I couldn't seem to get away from it. Um, but yeah, sorry, what was your question? So we're going back to the attraction of how you attracted Simone because yes. she's the opposite. Yeah, you know, it's probably, I don't really know because even when I met Simone, like me and Simone were kind of like, Sorry if she doesn't like this, but yeah, we were kind of like hooking up for a bit when yeah. we first met because she was fun. I remember like meeting her. I uh, met her at Loft on Batu Balong. This is actually, I think it's on New Year, like New Year's Day. And um, she was nuts. She turned out of like, for me, it was nuts at the time. She turned up without any shoes on. And it's <laughs> <laughs> me like fresh from London. And uh, um, she was like, she got up at one point to go to the toilet. I saw her like dancing down the road. And I was like, oh my fucking God, like, what am I doing? But you know, it was endearing to me because I was like, oh, this is different. This is nice. Yeah, and yeah. yeah, we ended up like having like a lot of our own shit going on. And we like hooked up a few times. And then just before the pandemic, I had a job over in the States. So I went over to America. She was in uh, Costa Rica at some festival. And um, yeah, it was almost like that was kind of just done. And um, then when the pandemic happened, I had to cut my job short. I had to fly back to Bali. I got in literally the day before the airport closed. Oh, did you? So, so did I. I, really? got in, I got on the same day. Really? Two hours left yeah. to spare. Well, yeah, oh, fuck. On. Yeah, okay. Well, yeah, you beat me. But still. <laughs> yeah, it was like the day before. And um, it was an interesting time because it gave us a chance to... It, you remember it. It was weird here, wasn't it? It, it was, was very a, weird. It was a ghost town. There's no one yeah. here. And it was almost like your life was just like, it was just a bit of a time out, wasn't it? Like nothing really matters for the minute. Like we could all be dead. People yeah. thought we were all going to die. I remember <laughs> seeing like pictures of like people in China, like getting collected yeah, off the streets and chucked that. in yeah. the back of a van. And I was like, wow, I was like, this could actually be pretty bad. So yeah, it was like an interesting time. And uh, I felt like this overwhelming sort of protection over her. And uh, because I don't think she was like, she couldn't work. She had nothing to do here and like everything had closed. So, yeah, I don't know. I just sort of started helping her out a bit. And she had the dogs and they all got fucking sick. She had like eight dogs. What the fuck was I thinking? She had eight <laughs> dogs. She had eight dogs and they started getting sick and I was like helping her out with them. And yeah, it was just like, as soon as I started getting to know her, she was again, she's like, I'm, I'm too skeptical, I know. But she was like my business partner. When I first met her, I was like, no one is this nice. I was like, you're full of shit. No mm -hmm. one's this nice. But she is. She's just a nice girl. And I gave... The ch I gave myself the chance to get past that stage to get to know it, even though I knew that she wasn't really the typical thing that I went to. And I really, it just opened me up to a different level of emotion and a different level of connection that I just wasn't used to. Someone genuinely, people say they care about you all the time, you know, it's very easy to sort of throw that around. But even in my old relationships, I always kind of felt like I was a little bit in competition with them. It's weird. Like if I would do something good, it would be like a slight against them. Mm. I mean, when I met Lewis and Liam, when I first took them on, when they took me and filmed all that content, my ex came with me. I remember getting matched up. I don't like them. I don't trust them. <laughs> it's like, you can tell. She's like, oh, I don't like this. I don't like what's mm. going on here. And uh, yeah, Simone is just like completely, she's an open book. She's like this endless stream of like support and love. And she, yeah, uh, it's, um, I do think that it's quite rare. I've not, I've not met anyone like her before. And like, I did think it was bullshit, but it's not. She's just, I've, I've definitely changed her a little bit. You know I mean? <laughs> she's a little bit more down to earth now, trust me. No, she is. Cause like, yeah, when I met her, there's like, like I said, it was like, she wears shoes now as well. See, she, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah it was just sort of it was she didn't know who I, who I was either yeah. it was unencumbered with all the fucking the social media and like the uh, the money she didn't know what I used to do for work even you know she was, I don't even think she fully understood it like up until recently what I used to do or anything you know mm -hmm. like trade it well, maybe yeah. she I don't know, like, but it's, it was never like a conversation yeah um, I think I asked her what she did when I first met her. I was like, so what do you do? She's like, what do you mean? <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, this is a trick question. <laughs> I was like, what do you do for work? She's like, I just, you know, do whatever I can. To That's help. the answer she gave me as really? well. <laughs> okay. I was like, okay. Yeah, I guess. see, this is Simone. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it, it works. And like, I don't know, it's weird because I'm. I, I like a good argue every now and then, just to kind of get it out. I said, you can't argue with Simone. That's the only, that's the only thing. That's the only, I wish we could have like a little, like 1%, like a little argument every now and then. Um, because yeah, like, but then again, it does, it ends it quickly because I'll like have an argument and then she'll just look, that's fine. And then she'll, well, I'll be like, instantly I'll be like, oh fuck, I'm, I'm the worst human being in the world. <laughs> Like she's too nice, all right. You're too nice. No, so you guys get along like a house on fire. We like don't. You guys most, most don't really time. have any quarrels or 
No, like, you have I, a little I, bit. I can be a bit grumpy. Yeah. But she's so patient. She's so good, you know. Mm. And it's like everything, everything comes from a good place and it, it's dealt with in the right way. Mm. And she's, I've got like a long way to go. But yeah, she's, she's so good. Yeah. That kind of thing. It's not like it's not like I don't get stressed out and I don't need my space a lot and stuff like that. But she's just good at respecting it, you know. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, babe, I need to get some shit done in my office. She just lets me do it, and I still have these sort of like anxieties around doing it. Because I think, fuck me, if I said that to like my ex, I'd be like given the sign treatment for a week, and I'd be like, I just want to get some work done. Whereas, yeah. like, of course, like, what do you need to do? I have to like, I've got business in London. I've got business. I have to go to my nan's funeral. And I'm like, hey, I've, just, I've got to shoot to Dubai for a few days. I've got to get like a visa stamp. But I need to go to London. She's like, of course, like, don't worry. Let me know if there's anything I can do for you. I'm like, fucking, it's so nice to just be in that kind of like, just very mature, very understanding and kind of like how relationships should be. It shouldn't be like this point scoring system. Like, oh, you're going away. I'm going away with the council. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to La Favela tonight. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, yeah, this, this is, it seems like that's made you. Because you both complement each other, right? So yeah. now it's made you more. It is. I, I'd say before this, you're you're like a distinguished gentleman. <laughs> yeah. Because like you're that. you're like doing all these reviews. Like you like to do reviews as well. Like I do yeah. of the products. Like we talk about. I've never heard someone talk about planes in terms of the product. Oh yeah. Like you're like true. oh this product, this business class product, <laughs> this this Etihad <laughs> first class. You know. Like, yeah. See, that, that's like I'm like a real AV geek. Yeah, like yeah. you can show me any sort of business class product, and I'll probably be able to tell you which plane it's from. Mm. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> that's cool. But yeah, no, it's like a real passion mine. And like yeah. again, people misunderstood it being like. If I say something bad about it, like you bastard, you think about how premium. Right. I'm, like, I'm not doing it to do that. I'm exactly. like, some people genuinely message me and they're like, you know, handsome, don't you? Yep. He messaged me the other day and he's like, I'm taking the dogs back to, uh, they're taking them to Portugal. He's like, can you tell me what plane would be better to take them on? And if you, I think they're flying with Qatar. He's like, which business class? I oh, know they're taking them with Singapore. And he was like, yeah, which business class products? There's a few. And I was like, make sure you get the uh, A380. I was like, there's a lot more space. <laughs> yep. There's a lot more enclosed. And that's what the kind of shit that I'm doing. And I was like, I'm passionate about it. I'm mm. not doing it to fucking rub people up the wrong way. And if yeah. you are, fuck you. I mean, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so what is the best business class product okay. for airlines? For business class products? Mm. Probably Singapore because okay, let's have a let's let's break that down. So it used to be I would say Oman Air because Oman Air used to have it was kind of dated, but in terms of like space, you would get like a first class seat pretty much. Second is Singapore Airways. Singapore Airways has a fucking huge seat, but the only thing is if you when you actually turn it into a bed, unless you get the bulkhead, which is the front of the plane, your feet have to go into sort of like a small coffin thing, and then. You've got A and A, uh, All Nippon Airways, which is Japan, yep. and you get like a, something called the, uh, I think it's called the Sweet. Oh, there's a few called the Sweet, but yeah, essentially it's like a giant seat like this, like tw twice the width of me that folds. Up. I'm going to show you a master as well. And, you can be, and then of course there's the Q Suite, which is Qatar, which is uh, you can bake. You've got like the closing doors. You can get the the partition down in the middle. You can make it into a double bed. If you're with the family, you can get the two on the other side as well, and the middle bit comes over. But there's a few. But yeah, awesome. my, my favourite is probably, I think, Singapore yeah. in general. Yeah, Service is um, impeccable with yeah. Singapore as well. What about Japan Air? Have you been on Japan? Yeah, JAL was good. Yeah. But they're, and like their, their business size products are right. The, the Japanese are unparalleled for service. Mm. My God, the yeah. service is so good. And the food's great as well. Mm. But yeah, ANA, which is the other Japanese one, they're, yeah. they're better than, uh, ah, okay. than uh, JAL. Yeah. Right. So what about first class? First class, Singapore offers a, I mean, depends what aircraft you get. Mm. Emirates has got a really good one on their uh, A380s on their, uh, so some of their 777s have a new enclosed suite, which is basically, oh, sorry, I keep hitting that. Um, and it is completely enclosed. It's the only one in the world. So floor to ceiling, you've got a door and you can shut it off and you've got this giant armchair, huge TV, food, obviously, the Middle Eastern Airlines, they do it so well. Uh, that's really good. Etihad, another Middle Eastern one, they do uh, the apartment, which is kind of like an apartment. You go in there, there's this giant armchair, you've got a 32 inch TV on the wall, you've got a bed that actually turns into a bed. That's on their A380. Um, Singapore do a similar product, which is like a, an enclosed room with like a bed that folds out. You can put the middle down, it turns into a double bed. It's not like that on Etihad, it's only the, the front half. Um, and uh, you get this big swivel armchair. Uh, Qatar first class isn't, isn't so good, but yeah, the best one, Singapore and 
and Singapore Etihad or Emirates mm. are definitely the best. Okay, yeah. cool. And and the next question people probably have is: Are you paying full price for those every time you travel, or are you gaming the system, so to speak? <laughs> I mean, I got a lot of points. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got a lot of points. I don't get a deal or anything like that. Yeah. I mean, some sometimes maybe I'll, I'll get something, but yeah, there's always hacks with airlines. Mm. If you, a lot of the Middle Eastern ones will let you bid on a ticket. So if you book business class within a certain window before your flight, if it's not too busy, they'll let you bid on a ticket and they'll give you a minimum one, but you can sometimes upgrade for like 500 quid, something like that. I'm going to uh, Dubai next week and I upgraded to first class for like 350 quid from a business class ticket. Wow. Yeah, it's cheap. Get it, get it at the right time. You got Amazing. it. Yeah, because it's from Jakarta. It's not a very popular... Uh, no, actually, it's from Bali. But yeah, it's not a very popular route for first class. Mm. If you do between London and Dubai, very rare ah, you're going to get yeah, that yeah. because it's such a... It's obviously a busy-ish route, but not many people fly in first class. Mm. You're at your typical holiday maker coming out here isn't splashing for first class. Yeah. And if you're going back, obviously, it's like an extortion amount of price. It's very... So not many Bali, not don't want to be offensive, but yeah, not many Balinese are going to shell out like a huge amount for a ticket, mm. uh, unless they are like, like uh, very rich, rich ones, I guess. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's there's ways of doing it. There's there's certain times to convert points that you get like extra bonuses on. Uh, I use Amex Platinum, so yeah. I can just kind of put it over to any airline that I want. Um, I'm also with some. There's like yeah, there's there's a few different chains that you can get involved with where they'll they'll give you some benefits. Um, and the, some, some as well, you can do it at the airport. It depends. It's changed a little bit. I used to get a better rate when you go to the airport and be like, I want to upgrade. But yeah, it was like, it's not so so easy like that anymore. I think it's better to get the uh, the um, online upgrade mm. version. Yeah. <laughs> so when, you, when you're traveling, are you traveling with a photographer? Like, because you, your photos looks are amazing. Like it, it. it looks no, like it. No, we don't. No, we don't. So we use a tripod. Uh, Simone is a really good photographer, actually. It's freshly learned. She was like, I want to start learning photography so we got like a professional camera I used to take only up until about a year ago I used to take everything on my phone and yeah. I just thought yeah there's no difference and as soon as I got like a real professional camera I was like wow that's so much better she's learned that inside out so she'll take like a lot of the photos if I need a photo but then the ones that we have together I'm an expert with a drone I love flying drones I'm really good with that um, but yeah we'll just use a tripod mm. and just set the timer but yeah I'm extremely good at editing Yeah, you know like uh, it's always been a passion of mine because obviously from a very young age, I was traveling a lot and you should like my early edits are just like hilarious. Like, but yeah, I just, it's such a passion of mine. So I just ended up really getting involved in just making epic pictures, you know, mm. There's a lot of tricks there as well. Yeah, I didn't know you edited stuff, but I saw something on your story when you came back from Flores and you were like, oh, I'm editing. I'm like, he edits his stuff. Yeah, it's cool. It's cool. We've yeah. used like a, a photographer a couple of times before. Like, oh yeah, we used Alina once. Oh yeah, yeah. She did some photos for us. But yeah, like typically if we're away, like we're going to Uber this weekend and we're just going to get some, some, some nice pictures just for, I don't know, it's just nice. I like looking at my page and just going down and being like, oh, that's good. Yeah, and it's, it's nice like to document the, Memories, yeah, right? For like, sure, hundred percent. Life is about experience. You're experiencing exactly. new things. You want to document exactly. it in a nice way. Yeah, it does. I mean, it, it probably has a knock-on effect for business. People probably sometimes see it and think, oh, "I wonder what he does." But then it's not. There's no direct correlation between it. Mm. It should be more, but yeah. It's, well, the the, 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 percep the set perception is he's enjoying his life. Yeah, well, glad I'm glad it comes off like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. it's like oh, he's enjoying his life. He's living a luxury lifestyle. Yeah. That's what I want. You know, yeah, like, everyone that's, wants that's that. What was, that's yeah. what I was going for. Yeah. And he's he's showing us the life. Like he's he's not just like hiding it. He's showing us. Like, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's good. Good. Yeah. Appreciate it, man. Thank yeah. you. So we've been going for a while. I just want to wrap it up. How so long have we been going for? Two hours, 20 minutes. Two hours. <laughs> Fuck it out. Might have to chop it down a little bit. Huh? <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> Sorry, mate. You, you That's know. always the way. Like when I tell guests how long they've been talking, they're like, fuck, you know. Well, it goes, <laughs> mate. So um, I only have one last question for you, actually. Yeah. And I asked every guest this, so it's going to be cool. I'll make a compilation of it. Mm. Every guest has a different answer. Um, so what is the meaning of life in your own words? Ooh, I mean, it's got to be just to uh, enjoy it as much as you can, right? I'm mm. sure that's a really generic answer. But when I actually think about, when I'm faced with mortality, like with my nan dying and stuff like that, I just think like, fucking hell, I would hate to look back when I'm very old and just think, God, I don't really do much. You know, mm. God, what did I do? It has to be about experiencing it. You can never really scratch that itch. I'm always like, I need to experience more, I need to do more, and then I do it, and I'm like, oh, I didn't, and I still need more of it. But I, it's got to be just to really enjoy your time here, you know. Just it can, it's, it's horrible when you 
see your parents getting old and you realize like, fuck, we're here for such a short amount of time. Another 30 years, I'll be 60. You know, I really want to look back and be like, fuck, I really had the best swing out of that. Like I didn't, didn't take any chance. I didn't, sorry, I didn't take any risks not doing anything. I uh, just jumped, jumped straight in. God, I don't think I worded that very well. But yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and that's it. And that's where it comes down to like the business. I want to do, I want to work and I want to make shit tons of money, but I want to do it while also really enjoying my life and making sure that everyone that I care about is completely looked after and uh, gets to enjoy life as, as much as I do. That's mm. it. Absolutely. If I if I could take anything away when I die, that would be it. That would be my one goal to just know like I had a fucking good time. Yeah. Mm. That's awesome. That's mm. amazing. And um, yeah, like I, as you say that, I'm thinking about the the effect that having a good father has on has on you had on you as well. Yeah, for you sure. know, like your upbringing and yeah. just how that molded your business mindset and for sure. just your resiliency as well. And yeah, just, that's so important for it people is. to have it in their is. life. Makes a huge difference, yeah. you know. And I, I I feel bad for people that don't have like certain guidances and, and stuff like that. But yeah, I'm so forever grateful that I have. Uh, I've always had that level of support behind me in terms of like, fuck it. Like, my dad was always the one that was telling me when I was like in my twenties. Like, he's like, nothing, you ma- nothing you do now matters. He's like, if you fuck it up, nothing matters. You got such a long time to build it back. He's like, what well, you think I'm gonna li- let you live in the street? He's like, of course not. He's like, do take the risks, do everything you can now. He's like, if you fuck it up, you fuck it up. It's life. <laughs> mm, true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if you're 20 years old or if you're in your twenties. Take that advice to the bank. <laughs> All right. Johnny Mitchell, thank you very nice much for coming man. on, mate. Cheers. Really appreciate this. And where can people find out more about you? If they're listening in, because obviously I'll link it up below. But Sure. Yeah, you can uh, check me on Instagram, uh, Johnny underscore Mitchell 1991. If you want to learn a little bit more about the Coaching Masters, go to thecoachingmasters.com. Uh, and if you're interested in checking out our crowdfund as well, you can just Google the Coaching Masters crowdfund and you can come and see what we're doing and the innovations we want to work on and kind of the next stage of our world domination journey. Awesome. Congratulations on everything you're doing with that. Bro. Appreciate and, it. Uh, yeah, great interview. Nice. Thank you. Thanks,